Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So Fast to freedom, Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate. This is Mike. A little bit of a different episode this week, just getting on a little bit beforehand. As y'all might know, this is one of our episodes where friend of the show and uh, official English voice of Dragon Gate, Jay Church, stopped by, joined us. We recorded this on last Saturday. And I say that because, of course, I'm recording this little intro here on the 29th, and uh, Dragon Daya has been announced to be a member of Best of the Super Junior. And because we t- didn't know that was happening, I thought that it would be worth uh, worth letting y'all know just context with that. And it, as with these kind of episodes we do with Jay, just frame of time with that, and just a little bit of a programming note. This serves as our uh, dead or life review and uh, we will be back next week with our full review of that case as well has an excellent written review uh, preview up at voices of wrestling.com be sure to check that out as well but that's it uh, let's get into the interview with Jay it's about two and a half hours a really fun one here and hope you all enjoy and we'll be back with y'all next week with our dead or alive review take care everyone have a good week bye Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate. Mike Spears alongside Kay Slow. And at this time, we are joined by the official English voice of Dragon Gate Pro Wrestling. It's Jay Church. Jay, how are you doing today? I'm great. Uh, long time no see, guys. Happy to be back. It, it feels like that this is kind of like late April, early May over the last few years has been kind of the uh, Voice Gate Jay episode. So it feels like we've <laughs> developed like a nice tradition here, but it's great having yeah, you back well, here. Uh, I was wondering if I was going to get the invite this year or not, <laughs> actually. Oh, well, no, we're, we're happy to have you because I think I, we, we did April last year and then we did you right before World because we, we had to talk about the fallout of some people that didn't make it back from Mexico. But I think the topics this time around are going to be much happier. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's still some people overseas. I hope they make it back. It's overseas right now. Junior. Hmm? Mochi Jr. Oh, yeah, no, he'll, he'll be back. He has, he has to come back. Estrella, I don't know if he's coming back, but <laughs> Junior, Junior will be back. Thank God. I mean, Junior's, like, bizarre adventure that he's had in the United Kingdom. He goes, he gets a crown, he goes and buys an original pair of Doc Martens. It, it's something where, like, I feel like he should have to do a full summer report on his British vacation, because it sounds, like at least following along, like, on social media it looks like it's been fascinating like he is having a ball yeah i mean i'm, I'm sure he's picked up absolutely no english whatsoever <laughs> while he's over there but uh yeah no i hope i hope he's having a good time hope he's having a good time don't know who he's don't know who he's staying with but hopefully whoever ho ho has set him up with is taking care of him so uh, one of the things that has happened over the last year and we're kind of still in the uh 
we're, we're, we're kind of still seeing the after effects of that. One of the first things that we would kind of wanted to talk about was uh, this year, uh, the first time in 11 years, Dragon Gate was at WrestleMania. Jay, you made the trip over for that as well. And just uh, uh, I, it, it's been something that I feel like over the last few years, we've kind of talked back and forth about and been like, OK, what would happen if this was kind of the if Dragon Gate finally re- returned at WrestleMania, kind of the weekend that Dragon Gate made, put its name at least on the Western map, and at least the way I look at it, made WrestleMania weekend. What were your, bi- your big kind of takeaways and impressions going to Philadelphia last month for WrestleMania? And especially getting getting the chance for the, uh, uh, the, the six-man tag in the ETU show, both felt like that they were two really well-received receive things i i know i adore the etu show at least yeah people really seem to like the etu show um and uh that was really the only thing from the entire time i was there that i actually got to do on any sort of sleep whatsoever so it's the only thing i really have like a good memory of but you know everyone there you know everyone at etu was really cool you know they were super happy to have us we were super happy to be there um the vibe in the crowd was really good because you know that was a show that was outside of like the city center and away from all like the you know the collective stuff and ecw arena stuff so like if, and it was i think during the first day it, the first day of wrestlemania it was starting as that show was going on so like the people that were at that show weren't just people that were there for you know to be a part of the weekend they were at that show because they wanted to be at that show um so yeah the etu show was a lot of fun it was really um privileged to be a part of that um the, the gcw stuff i don't remember all that much because i was on like absolutely no sleep whatsoever i i found uh, and this seems to be a reoccurring theme where you know this happened uh this has happened when shun and yamato have worked gcw before this happened when shun worked west coast pro where you know for the gcw stuff they were not necessarily over when they walked through the curtain, but through effort and through what they did in the ring, by the end of it, it seemed like GCW, like that crowd was was invested. But it it's certainly, and I, you know, I, I would say it's a fair assessment that I watch a little bit more indie wrestling than you do, uh, US indie wrestling at this point than you do, Jay. But I think that's a common theme with these game changer crowds is, you know, 2005, 2006 Ring of Honor crowd, I think they wanted to like you a little bit. Same with that era of PWG. This Game Changer crowd has a little bit of like, you have to impress me. And if you're a Dragon Gate guy, we don't know who you are. But if you work hard, uh, you can win us over. And I think that's what happened by the end of that six man. Sure, sure. Yeah, that was the impression I got. And, you know, that was such, it's such an eclectic crowd because that, I mean, that was the spring break show. So there was, you know, there was like, an, there was like Maki Ito and, uh, whoever like Minoru Suzuki and Masato Tanaka and then there was like all kinds of different stuff on that show so for us to kind of come out in the middle of it was kind of a tough spot and also um different from the ROH time in that it wasn't wasn't like a showcase it wasn't the only match we went over there for like these guys were it was like you know their fourth or fifth of eight matches that was on that was on the schedule and so it was and you know people have seen it before Um, yeah did you happen to see i don't i don't know if you were in town by this point did you see the dragon gate cmll 10-man tag no the only i didn't get in until um it it was a series of unfortunate events that essentially led to me and benke not getting there until 2 a.m like whatever the midnight show um that that we had a match on Oh yeah, the um, the GCW JCW versus the World Show. Yeah, yeah. Like Benke didn't get into the, the Newark airport until like twelve thirty a.m. and like um, you know, I went, I got in at like I I got there at like nine p.m. I waited around, charged all my phone, charged all my stuff, went, picked up the rental car, parked it, went and waited for him, and I sent the message. And I said, I'm waiting for Benke. Benke, come to this place. And I got, and you know the GM was like, don't go to the hotel, just come to the venue. I'm thinking, like, this is a two-hour drive. 
going to be 1230 when his plane lands, much less when we leave. Like, we're not going to get there in time. But no, there was still like an hour left in the show when we got there. <laughs> um, As someone who used to go to a lot of WrestleMania weekends, uh, that that is very par for the course for GCW being able to run until about 4 a.m. much longer than anyone has energy for. Yeah, it was about 4 a.m. And then half the guys had to be up at eight to get to rest to be in the first rotation at WrestleCon. So uh yeah, like the on the floor at WrestleCon was the first thing that I was involved in. So that the G C W six man and then the ETU show were the only things that I that I saw while I was there. Uh, the, gotcha. Everything else. Everything else. Like if I was physically there, I was at the merch table. But okay. like I didn't I didn't get there until until then. So I I I ask about the uh, the CMLL tag just because it was the it, it was jarring because that high spot show used to be uh, like kind of the indie all star show and I always felt like it had a pretty in the know crowd but for as hot as CMLL seems to be in America right now that crowd was not into the Dragon Gate guys they were not into the CMLL guys and that was really the right. match where it's like oh man if this had a a half decent crowd this could really be a cool match especially with the Shun and Mystico stuff that was happening but that was the one over the weekend that I thought was was disappointing mainly just because of the crowd reaction nobody nobody seemed into it they were way more into like the Dolph Ziggler match or the ECW nostalgia stuff on that show sure I mean I, I was talking about this with Coho like like two hours ago but we were talking about you know next year and all those things um and you know because the the bosses were like impressed at what stardom was able to do on the, on their show like in terms of draw and everything and like i just don't think that um i don't know how can i say this like that's where most of the the fans are going these days because there's so much wrestling on on tv you know there's like what 17 hours of wrestling on tv every week now yep between across the different promotions but you know 10 years ago or not 10 years ago 15 years ago there would be like the post that were like okay there was two you know three hours of raw two hours of smackdown there was 15 minutes of women's wrestling on tv and those posts now are you know in 137 hours of tv this week there was an hour of women's wrestling and you know that's that's where the demand is right now. So I just, I don't think that, you know, it's hard to bring a match that isn't too dissimilar to what is on TV, you know, like a Dragon Gate six man, you know, if depending on your opinion, you know, it might be better, might not be better, but it, it's still very similar to what is on TV. So it's much harder to win people over. Oh yeah. Just coming and in and it, doing that type of, doing that type of match. And it's something that, I mean, if we're really, like, talking big picture it, it, and, like, how at least U.S. wrestling evolved, uh, Dragon Gate was so far ahead of everything in 2006 that just, like, I, I have an overall theory about how pro wrestling is at a point now where, at least in the United States, it's all about the content contracts. It's all about the media rights, really, at the end of it. But if you're talking ring style... It, it's something where at least I feel like not necessarily that that Dragon Gate got passed by, but everything has now become such a melange of of Lucha Resu, uh, Strong Style, all of the the various things that what, what Dragon Gate would present at least in 2006. When you look at the re especially the rest of that Ring of Honor card, and uh, I mean yes, you did have a Danielson a strong match go nearly an hour in 2006, but you, you were doing something like so different. And then, yeah, I, I, I completely see the point about the underserved market, especially with women's wrestling. And I think that it's it's something where traditionally, and I feel like over the last few years of Mania Weekend with like the explosion of the multiple sites that like the, the, the GCW site, the IWTV site and all these things that it's kind of in a way, not only is there more wrestling there, people are able to kind of go towards these market inefficiencies. And that's why you could see stardom do what was it 800 900 people at that uh sure. ecw arena show yeah yeah exactly i agree 100 percent. jay let me ask you just real quick this isn't anything to do with mania weekend but since we're on the topic of women's wrestling and i like picking your brain about what's happening in japan right now do you have any marigold mm. thoughts mm. um 
Well, I mean, well, they sold out their first show. Um, they've, they're going to do a big show that is probably going to do really well, and they're going to have, what I understand, a pretty big surprise <laughs> for that show. So, um, you know, they've got momentum, but they don't have financial backing. They're using, uh, you know, Rossi's retirement fund. And, uh, you know, Dragon Door sold out their first show, too. <laughs> so, um, you know, as always in wrestling, the most money to be made is everybody together fighting against each you know, everybody working together. But, you know, that's just not how it works in wrestling, right? And it's kind of fascinating to me that you have this kind of splinter that at least with Dream Star Fighting Marigold, which I'm obsessed with the name Dream Star Fighting Marigold, by the way. Uh, it's, it, it is just something that it really feels like that everything over the last five years, and really if you look at like when Bushiro came aboard with Stardom, it was going to be kind of like a predestined thing that Rossi eventually was going to go like, oh, I'm done here, or... Bushi Rose can be like, okay, we're done with this here. We're moving on without you. So I, I, I guess like seeing that they sold that, sold out that show and then like everything else, like they're they're going to like Shinki, but they're not having anything that, that they shouldn't have any issues not selling out, at least for that first tour. I just wonder like at a certain point with like a roster of that size and especially with the idea that your ace is going to be going back and forth to the United States and then pretty much over in the United States still, as soon as all the paperwork's done, it, it, it does make you kind of want, uh, wonder, like, can the, is there going to be, like, a, a enough steam to offset the fact that a retirement account is eventually going to get uh, liquidated if things don't get, like, re if revenue doesn't come in? Well, what if they got, let's say they got Iwatani? What do you think? Would that be enough to offset Julia going? I mean, I, I, I think that it's kind of, for Iwatani, that is such a big kind of, it, it, in a way, I, I feel like there's the optical and the business changes in a way. And I feel sure. like doing, getting Iwatani right after her movie comes out, whatever her grace period or however long she has to be under contract after that for promotion reasons. I think that that does a lot. I just wonder for someone like Iwatani, who seems like more often than not, I mean, like, I, I feel like two or three years ago, everyone was saying like, oh, Mayu's on the way out. Mayu's on the way out. Whereas Julia, th it seemed like that th th that there was still uh, some something left to her ace dump that I, I wonder if that makes up for it. I, I feel like that Julia is kind of a unique piece that although Mayu kind of fulfills a lot of different roles, and especially if you do do like the diametric uh, stardom versus Marigold thing, that's a huge dig. I just wonder just everything all encompassing with Julia, if that makes up for it. I don't know. It's not that popular in Japan. So, but I don't know. Totally, totally different topic. I don't. Well, so, how, how has, you know, every time we have you on, you know, we, we've talked to you a lot since 2020 when the world initially shut down. And I'm proud of this podcast. Cause I feel like for English speaking Japanese wrestling content, we've been pretty, uh, realistic about the state of the wrestling economy and the slow comeback that it's had. But a lot of that Intel obviously comes from UJ and we're, you know, 14 months removed from everything quote unquote being back to normal. Are, are you feeling in the buildings? Like things are a little healthier. Is it worse than before? What, what is the economy like in terms of Dragon Gate right now? Um, well, I mean, what is, what is worse than before? I mean, um, I mean, it depends. You know, the people that are coming out are enthusiastic. Um, obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done, and that's not not just here; that's everywhere. Um, you know, uh, but you know, the people that are coming out are enthusiastic. They're picking favorites. Um, you know, the vet the veterans, guys like Yamato and Dragon Kid and Doi, doing more this year has been has been a little has been helpful. Um, but you know, still a lot of work. Still a lot of work to do, I think. I mean, we'll see how Nagoya does. I, I mean, it's the last show in Nagoya ever, but um, yeah. Well, actually, I'm I'm glad you brought that up real quick. So that arena is going under construction. I read that Oda Ward City Gymnasium is going under construction. Is that true? Um, so Oda Oda is closed for the rest of this year. Um, I think it opens back up in April. 
next year, I think April 1st, is because um, they're doing renovations on the ceiling or the roof. One of the two. Uh, Dangerous Gauge is going to happen this year. It'll be somewhere else. Um, not not someplace super exciting, but a place that's at, at scale in Kanto. Um, that'll probably, uh, honestly, what's... It might be announced by the time you hear this, because it'll probably... Date, in date and location will get it probably get announced with the May schedule with the the July schedule because the big shows usually get go on pre-sale a month ahead of time. Um, so OTA, yeah, OTA is not available until April. Dolphins Arena is closing, like it's not under construction; it's closing next year around around this time because they've built a new gigantic stadium. Yeah, right B League, right? Next, right, right next door. Um, and it's like, I think 16,000 for sumo. So it's, you know, since the sumo setup is not too dissimilar to what the setup for pro wrestling would be. So that, I mean, it's, it's scaled out for everybody. And even, you know, New Japan would probably have a tough, have a tough time in that building. Um, so, I mean, there'll be shows there up until, you know, up until this time next year. So maybe up until Golden Week next year. But from what UT was saying, and he was, he's from Nagoya, so he would know. He said that, you know, there's nothing, there's no viable replacement for it from next year. So this is probably the last dead or alive. And then the other venue, uh, Nagoya, Congre Nagoya Congress Center is closing. It was supposed to be closed already, but the construction got delayed a year, half year. Um, that's going to be closing for like 18 months in February or March of next year. Um, it's kind of, it'll it'll open again in 18 months, but so that's eight, 18 months with no mid-size and no large-size venue in Nagoya, and that doesn't just affect us; that affects everybody because everybody uses Nagoya Congress Center to at you know different levels of success. So it's going to hurt. Nagoya, Nagoya is going to be kind of a lost market for a while, unless there's a viable alternative. Like there's a, uh, the Nagoya Congress Center website like recommends an alternative venue, but that venue, but they're recommending it for like banquets and conferences and things like that. So whether it's viable for pro wrestling, I have no idea. And I've always considered, and we talked about this, I, th I think a year ago, but you know, Nagoya's historically been one of your top markets, but especially over the last few years, you okay. know, yeah. The, the way they've based it around Dragon Kid and then UT and then, you know, for a while there, Kento. I mean, this is a huge loss for everybody, but Dragon Gate specifically seems to be hurt pretty bad by this. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, Dragon Kid, UT, Ultimo, um, and then you also get the the spillover from Gifu, Gifu and Nie, which are kind of, you know, sub neighboring prefectures. But Gifu is a really hot market right now because of you know, Shun, Minora, Yoshioka, you know, all, all of the, and well, Problem Dragon, actually more than anybody out of all those <laughs> we, guys. We talked at length of... last year about the King of Gate homecoming show in Gifu with the, with the stalker anniversary match and then Minora and Yoshioka. That was one of our favorite shows of last year. Yeah, it was a great show. I mean, a great show, super, super environment. I mean, there's also, you know, like Kato is from there. I mean, there's like, they do... There's two different venues in Gifu. There's Juroku Plaza, and then there's whatever or whatever the other one is. Um, Koki, the one in Koki. So they can like that one is the Problem Dragon Kato Homecoming, and the other one is like Yoshioka Skywalker or Yoshioka Minora Homecoming, and then Skywalker. Skywalker's on the t the one with Problem Dragon. That's right. But you know, like there's five guys from Gifu, so, and like that. You know, they would; those people would come because it's not a far drive. You know, you could, it's a it's a one shot train to Nagoya. So, like those people who are coming to two or three shows are now only going to be going to one show because they're only going to go to the the local one. They're not going to come to the one in Nagoya. So, you know, that you know, it, keep, it loses engagement because rather than you know going to the you know going to the Gifu show in May and then coming back around or or July, and then going to the Nagoya show in August. You know, rather they're just going to go to the one in July now. So it, um, it hurts. It hurts. You know, the, we saw it in. You know, and this is again not just Dragon Gate. This is everybody feels it in Kyushu when you know with Star Lanes gone. Star Lanes was a place that you could do a reasonably important show. You could do a Dream Gate title match. You could do title matches. You could do angles. You could do 
you know, you could do a real show there because it was a decent capacity. And because of the capacity, you could get, you know, people from Kumamoto could come in, people from Kagoshima could come in for it. But now you've got, you only have Akros, which even if you sell it out, the max you're selling out 600 people, 650 people. And, you know, it's hard to build an audience for that. Because even if you start selling out at 650 every time, if in the ideal situation, it's the same people buying those 650 tickets. So you're only being, you're only showing your product to 650 sets of eyes. And that's not, you know, it's not ideal. And that's why, you know, so it's like Final Gate are, you know, anything else, but, you know, they're a disaster every year now because it's just so hard to build excitement in the market because the mid-sized venue is gone. And again, that's a thrust, but, you know, everybody, you know, even, you know, like New Japan went from Fukuoka Dome to, you know, they're back, to, they're back to doing Kokusai Center and, you know, nobody else runs Kokusai Center. I think Noah does once a year, maybe, if that. And that's because the, the market is, the market is depressed now. Is it something where, like, I looked at, we, you, everyone in Gifu is something that I, th- I found kind of, like, remarkable and as like all these arenas are kind of going through this, this kind of I, I I've kind of observed this coincided with like the rise of the B League as like the J- Japan's professional basketball league as like this big kind of sporting alternative and feels like it's definitely something that feels like on the rise. Is, is it something where like at, at least like l- let's just say this is the last DOA at uh, Dolphins for. Well, well, it's the last DOA of Dolphins coming up. They, it closes down. Is it something where that the population demand? I mean, you, you talked about people just hopped on a train from Gifu. Is it something where there are B, B League arenas, not necessarily in Aichi, or maybe in Gifu, that might be supplanting that for the, the time being? Or is it something where like venue costs and everything like that well, is just makes it completely just out of the budget? Venues allowing pro wrestling is actually a really difficult thing. Um, you know, because that's where, you know, that's why in Sapporo, you know, there when Tyson Hall closed down, everybody moved to Mars Gym for a while. And, you know, Mars Gym was much smaller, but it was it was in a good location. It was still, you know, six six hundred, seven hundred people. But one day, the owner was just like, okay, no more wrestling shows, and that was it. Um, and then so that's even before you consider logistics and whether. You know, if it's a basketball arena, is it feasible to to go in and set up a wrestling ring and take it up and tear it down without any impact on, you know, whatever else they have there? Is there a place for entrances, you know, things like that? I mean, like Yokohama Budokan is a brand new arena that's like gorgeous for sports and basketball and things like that. But, you know, that's kind of a unicorn arena. Um, You know, there's no guarantee that there's, you know, like a Nagoya Budokan will open up that you know, fills that mid-sized rank, you know, just for pro wrestling. I mean, I don't know. Like, I asked uh, I asked Pato back, I don't know, back early, earlier this year. I was like, so, you know, is there something in Gifu? And he was like, mm, no, I don't think there is. So, um, it's rough. You know, I think about, like, think about, like, uh, Edion in Osaka and how, like, decrepit the bathrooms are whenever I'm in there. It's like, God, this building could really use a, really use a reform but then at the same time well this building gets this building closes for two years for renovations like fuck like that would be really that would be really bad so I, but you know it's a city-owned building the sponsor you know the edion sponsorship contract will run out eventually and you know you know you, know, you never know that's a that's a terrifying proposition to think about not having yeah, well, Especially hey. the smaller Osaka venue, just for all of wrestling. But again, obviously, especially you guys. Yeah, and hey, okay, I mean, look, you know, they the new new dome site got approved in Tsukiji got approved. So I mean, the Tokyo Dome is moving, and I mean, it's not until what twenty? I think they said twenty thirty seven. So that's like you know thirteen years from now. But you know, when the Tokyo Dome goes, Cork and All is going to go because Tokyo Dome City is going to get sold. So I, I was I was unaware of this. They're building a new Tokyo Dome. Yeah, um, it's, the, the, uh, this is the Yomiri land development, right? Or is this? Um, a, no, this or, is. Hold on, let me. Like I just saw, I just saw this 
think that the approval went through. Yeah, the. Uh, sorry, I have to find the article to give to give you the exact words. But yeah, no, no, it's okay. I'm got, curious. Yeah, no, it just it just got approved very recently. Yeah, so three days three days ago. Yeah, like there, I think there were rumors about like there have been rumors about like uh, a new token where where the old fish market used to be because the fish market has moved. Um, oh, that's right. So gonna, yeah, because that they're, moved they're like what use, five years ago. Yeah, before the pandemic, like that that moved over. So now, um, yeah, there's going to be so let's see, multi stadium with a capacity of fifty thousand visitors, roughly on par with the Tokyo Dome, uh, much larger than the much larger than the Budokan. Um, you know, the first sections of the development are projected to be open in 2029, with most of the place up and running by 2032. So that's actually not that far. That's actually not as far away. But you know, if the Tokyo Dome does, it, it, you know, if the Dome Tokyo Dome does close, Tokyo Dome, you know, Tokyo Dome City, there was a rumor that someone wanted to buy it and build condos there. You know, like if Tokyo Dome is gone, Tokyo Dome City, City Hall has no reason to exist. So you know, it's gonna happen. You know, rather than like you know, new traditions can be made, you know, like you can just go to Tokyo Dome and Cork and all closing, you know, as long as there's an equivalent place, you can have shows, but it's just whether there's going to be an equivalent place or not, particularly for Cork and Hall, you know, it gives a shit about Tokyo Dome, like, you know, losing a venue like that in Tokyo would be, I mean, I know some some promotions have been using, um, DDT just used it yesterday, the place where New Japan did uh, New Year's Dash this year, the Sumida Ku. Arena. I think they're they're testing that out. The promotions are testing that out as kind of a viable alternative for like an up to two thousand seat arena. And it's not fine. It's fine. It's in a it's in a good spot. But you know, who knows? What is uh, at this point? Because I know he's obviously at the shows, and it seems like they're doing something by way of him with Shuji Ishikawa and, and Shun. At this point, what is the LEC Corporation's involvement? Has it increased or decreased or stayed the same since the peak of the pandemic? Uh, stays, the, stays the same. You know, he's he does his. You know, now that um, now that he can, it's all mostly based around the shopping center stuff. Like the stuff with Fuji Shikawa is where they're doing. Uh, there's a shopping center show in Kawagoe sometime in May, and there's like a battle royal. In it, and like Ishikawa and Shun are going to be in the Battle Royal, so that's that's really all there is to that. Yeah, that's the one that has Tanahashi and Liger doing talks, right? Yeah, 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 I believe so. Is that just? I, I'm so curious, just culturally, because he's very, uh, I, I would say, upfront about his seemingly his wealth and just his position. Is it something where everybody is largely respecting him because of what he's doing for the industry? Or is it a weird, like, Hey, this guy is maybe like a, like an evil capitalist and getting involved in our wrestling. Um, I mean, I think everybody's thankful, you know, I mean, he does, he has a reputation of kind of being, being, uh, kind of wacky. And even before he got in pro wrestling, you know, I mean, he, he inherited his father's business, you know, that sort of thing, but you know, I mean, he's a proper, he's a you know proper businessman. He's not just like a netball baby or anything like that. And everybody's very thankful for his success or for his uh, support. Yeah, I I am. I I like I like when his name is on something. It normally leads to some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, like you know, Blue Yudan hasn't really hasn't really been that exciting. But I think that's more due to the fact that the talent pool available is not that exciting i guess is the best way to put it no i th i think the best one they did was last summer when they had the noah young boys on there and they did that that big trios match that show was exciting but i you know you don't have hadaka and a motivated sawa and a healthy daisuke sakamoto walking through that door anymore i, I almost wish it was almost a combination of buyuda and, and like a next type thing because I think the talent there is with a lot of young boys in Japan right now, or at least the intrigue there is with a lot of young boys in Japan right now, and not necessarily Mochizuki's era of junior heavyweights. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Um, I mean, I I thought it when uh, Hayato and Junior were going at it, maybe on the first show, like that was kind of the peak of the, the Buiden revival for me. But 
you had um, the you had the genius idea of uh, Mochizuki Junior Ryoto, or you wanted to rename him in the Fujita Junior Hayato way, and I I can't believe that didn't come to fruition. Yeah, I mean that would have been. Well, we'll see what happens when he comes back, right? Yeah, um, hopefully. Yeah. If he, throws, I, I, if he throws the name away entirely or what. Yeah, I personally, as soon as MMA Minorita was off the table, my personal enjoyment of Buyaden went down about 15%. Like, it, it, it is something where it does kind of fill, like, a kind of weird uh, little bit of the schedule right now. And I, I, I don't know necessarily if it's something where I, if it's going to be like revisiting kind of as Kay said the uh, uh 99 or the 90s and 2000s juniors being the, the kind of way forward it, it's something where i almost wonder with all the changes with the dragon gate schedule and everything if there if the next show is a little bit more uh would be a little bit more useful or uh appetizing for the market or if it's something where it's like do we need to like start taking prime zone on the road to use this kind of slot I don't think it doesn't make sense economically. I don't think. Um, like it's still very much in not the Dragon Gate thing. I think this is, most places are kind of still in pre- in like a prevent defense, and that there's not not many options for risks to be taken. Even Prime Zone, the format has changed. You know, it used to be standing only because you know you dip as many people as you could fit in, but you know it's exceeding now because you know, 90, whatever it is, 94 people is, like, best, best effort expectation. You, you know, know speaking Buyuden, of... Oh, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I mean, you know, for Buyuden, you know, I don't know. Like, I was disappointed when Fuda got hurt right before his first match on there because I think he's, of the young guys, you know, he's the one that would benefit the most from getting in there and doing doing those types of matches so hopefully he gets another opportunity to do that yeah absolutely i mean i think he's crushing it now that he's back i just really want him to stay healthy yeah yeah i mean that's one of those things with him is that you're going to be walking on eggshells and every time he sells the sells the shoulder a little bit more than usual or he bumps in a weird way you're just like oh shit here we go again yeah yeah we've talked about on this show the fact that if he can ever stay healthy for an extended period of time, he has that just that built up longing with us where it's like, we want this guy to succeed. And we, we got so close to it last fall and then he got hurt again. If he can ever stay healthy, I, you know, it almost, I think would work as a benefit to him, all these injuries because now he has this great story, but I also don't trust that he'll ever be able to stay healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I- feel the same way like if he's given a chance i think he'll do i think he'll do really well but he's you know he's gonna have to earn the confidence before he gets that i think you know and whether that's fair or not i don't know but i think it's just kind of kind of the reality reality of things and you know people people get hurt a lot in wrestling days so Uh, yes they do um in terms of subsidiary brands you know we were talking about uh the booyadin shows and and prime zone for a second i the only uh glake question i have for you is just more of a business question because i'm noticing you know they were running some black generation international produce shows last year and then they did another one this year but there was the yoshino show which had the look and feel and talent of a glate show but it was a Masato Yoshino produce show. And then they just did for the Lindemann anniversary, which he's been in wrestling 10 years now, which is mind blowing to me, but it was a, like a strong hearts presents great produce show. Is there any sort of sponsorship or financial incentive to book those shows with that branding compared to a great branding? Or is that just something weird they're doing? Um, I mean, if you do self promote shows, it's an event you have, I don't know how I'm going to say it. You can dip more into like your personal sponsor pool for that sort of thing. And you're more likely, you know, let's say you have a regular sponsor who, you know, comes to shows and says, you know, and provides a little bit of backing. If you're producing your own show, it's more incentive for, you know, the sponsor to pay out a little bit more. Okay. So those types of shows are always good, always good for that, that sort of, that sort of incentive. That makes that makes sense. Uh, that's uh, 
seems to be the direction Glate is going, and that certainly tracks with the people yeah. running that ship. Black Generation International, um, when uh, the leader of Black Generation is going to be here. At <laughs> it, the for Hong Kong shows, right? Uh, for now, just the Hong Kong shows, but possibly for more. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you know, that's... It, and, it, that's good. I don't know how that. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how it works. Um, I know that you know Big Lucha and Hong Kong Pro Wrestling Federation have a business agreement, and that's that's how it's happening. Um, beyond that, I don't know how it works, but man, that'll be that'll be something that will, that might be something that that's happening very soon. I, I'm sure you haven't, but have you seen Yamamura since he came back from injury again? I I watched uh, his comeback match. Okay, um, but otherwise I don't I don't watch what they do. Yeah, I, I I it's only it's annoying that like I am not into him coming back. I worry about his life every time I'm in the ring, but especially in some of the multi mans that he's worked since that comeback match, he's so annoyingly good at pro wrestling still that he sure. alone is sucking me back into that promotion. Yeah, but who's he wrestling? I mean, who are they wrestling against? Uh, no, know. no one on his level, which is jarring considering sure. the fact that he was out for as long as he was with the injuries that he's had. But it's, uh, it, you know, let me look at this cage match here real quick. I mean, he's wrestled. Uh, it's a lot black, of Issei. Yeah, a lot of Issei, a lot of Black Generation guys, but not even uh, Flamita primarily. Just like uh, you know, Ishida and Katar Suzuki and Hartley Jackson, and but a lot of Issei. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's his, his bro from the baseball team, so. Yeah, it makes sense. No, I mean, you know, do what makes you happy, <laughs> you know. As long as it doesn't kill you, I guess. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, that, you know, if, if something happens, that's on the people who let him back in the ring. Um, you know, he's got, uh, he's got the same, he had the same thing that uh, Big, Big E, WWE has. That Big E's not coming back from. It's the same. It's the same. It was the same injury. Um, you know, d- dislocated head, and uh, you know the C- C1 dislocation, and you know Big E's not coming back, and he has access to much better doctors than Yamamura does. Yeah, I just see whenever I I caught the big scar at the base of his skull, I was just like. That's a that's something yeah, that just screams out at me whenever I saw he's him. He's got to grow his hair out. He's got to grow his hair out. Like, yeah. If there, if anyone had any sense in the world, they would be telling him, "Okay, you need you're growing long hair and you're keeping it forever. As long as you're a wrestler, you're growing your hair out because like it's too, it's so attention grabbing." But again, you know, do do what makes you happy. So something that I kind of noticed over the last like 18 months, there probably was a better way to segue this a little earlier. Uh, Dragon Gate's schedule, at least as kind of a more older fan, has really gone through some big uh, changes over the last uh, two calendar years. First, bringing back Ray Day, Perejas, and reactivating the tag tournament, putting it in January. Now having Gate of Bayside and also looking at King of Gate happening after uh, after Kobe World this year. I, I, is it something where you think that this is a reflexive, as we were talking about earlier, the situation of venues right now in Japan? Um, or is this just kind of feeling um, out the schedule and, and what didn't work in the past and trying to fix that? Yeah, though, really. I mean, the, the venues that are being run haven't changed at all. I mean, the only thing, I mean, Yokohama Budokan is new, but you're still getting, you know, Two Corkins in January, June, and December, and you know Kobe. You know, basically, you move the calendar ahead one day, and by and large, it's going to be the same venues on the same days, year to year. Um, you know, in terms of doing the tag league and moving KOG, I think it's just more a sense of putting it in places that will help them from from a storytelling perspective you know, give fans something to invest in because you can't have, you know, January to May be completely open with nothing going on in in the modern in the modern climate, let's say. 
Um, but you know, market you know, mark, otherwise markets haven't decreased unless the venue goes away. You know, we still run in mostly the same markets. Run in the Osaka, Kyoto, Kobe, Tokyo, Hokkaido, you know, Hakata. You know, it's the same number of shows during the same time of the month. Year year on year, so from that perspective, there really hasn't been that big of a change. You know, Wakayama and Sendai are kind of floating dates that change from change from year to year, but you know, they're not. You know, they they still happen. Did you have a favorite match in the tag league this year? Um, aside from the final, um, shit. I mean, I have to I have to look at what happened in the tag league. I really liked um it was one of the one of the Kame Kame and Lee tags, I don't remember. They um, had the big hug, they had Ishin and Skywalker, they had Daya and Kakuta. It was the, the Daya and Kikuta match. Yeah. It was the one I really liked from um was that in Daya's home yeah, Daya Daya's homecoming show. Or the the, the Nagano show, yeah. I like that match. I like that match a lot. Um everything on the opening opening day was like the the match with big hug was really good um yeah i mean the, the the overall quality of the tag league was super super high this year i love that yeah um the, the the big hug and decourage match the 20 minute draw from yokosuka was really good as well i re- that was the only one i was disappointed in the finish by in terms of being a draw that felt like that felt like I just wanted a pinfall out of that so bad, and I was a little disappointed by the time limit draw. But I, I, I can't complain when the tournament ended on the note that it did with the four teams and the semifinals and finals, and then the obviously, I mean the the finals of that tournament is my current Dragon Gate match of the year. Yeah, it's, it's four old guys. <laughs> four four old guys that I turn. I mean, yeah. I, we we were talking about this with Doy, where it's like he might he might be doing the best work of his career right now. Um, I'm just so amazed if you look at, you know, obviously in 2020, he's great, but 2021 and 2022, Doi was injured and looked tired and kind of looked like he had done everything he was going to do. And ever since he went freelance, I mean, I love what he does in All Japan. The DDT stuff, when it's good, it's really good. But his work in, in Dragon Gate, I just, I can't believe how good he's been this year. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, re-energize, um, you know, not being, you know, not doing the full schedule will do, you know, do a lot, a lot for you. But, um, you know, it would be really cool if he was, you know, recommitted and, and around, a much, around much more. You know, I think having, I, I actually talked about this with him um, late last year, kind of like, you know, we need to put, we need to put you in a unit again. He's like, well, I don't, they don't, I don't have a, there's no place for me in, you know, in a unit. I'm like, what the tag with gold class while, while you're here. <laughs> yeah. and, and he's like, no, 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 I can't, you know, no, you know, no place, no place. And, you know, and I was saying that I was talking about this with him and a couple other people, you know, like with him, like the freelancers, like him and Ata at that time, you know, Ata was, was around at that time it's just like put them with somebody like they don't have to be you know just so they're teaming with the same people every time they're here so that way you know the fans that are just here as individual doi fans have someone to attach with to on the times when doi's not around you know put him back with gold class he teams with them when he's here and so the doi fans are cheering for gold class during the times that, that he's here, not just cheering for Doi while he's here. So I think putting him, and the same goes for, you know, Yamato Dragon Kid, you know, not just like the freelancers, but the guys that just aren't in a unit, you know, even, you know, putting together an old guy's unit is what it is, you know, I, but it's better than having them not be, you know, in something cohesive that you can, that people can rally behind as a, as a thing and not just as, as an individual. Well, you can sell some T-shirts this way, as you know. Uh, this is, I, I would say, just one of the many positives of having an old guy's unit around. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, it helps unify. You know, you can look out and you can see, you know, a group of three people sitting together wearing the same T-shirt instead of looking out and seeing three people. One's wearing a Dragon Kid shirt, one's wearing a Doi 
you know, a freelance doy shirt and the other one's, you know, wearing something else. You look out and those three people are wearing the same thing. So you kind of get more of a, a sense of the fans are into this as a thing and not just into their, whoever their favorite is. Yeah. I, it, go ahead, Mike. And it's something that at least I kind of harp on. Like if you look at the Dragon Gate unit landscape, the units by and large have been getting smaller and smaller over the years and having at least a coherent veteran army at the very least like i case is probably tired of me always saying like zebrats when zebrats was uh, like at four members you could only really do two matches with zebrats on the card when you have four members however if you have like a coherent uh veteran army at the very least there you have at least another big piece you're able to kind of play around with when you're filling out the cards that w with everyone being unaffiliated and it feels like that it we might be coming out of this huge like glut of unaffiliated Dragon Gate wrestlers right now. It, it it does seem like card construction as well gets a lot more streamlined when you have a, a veteran army and perhaps maybe we get to see some units outside of natural vibes approach six members. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what I'm hoping for. I mean the old guys group is the Yamato, Dragon Kid, Doi, Susumu, and Kage right now. So it's at five it's at five people. I'd like to see them swerve a little bit and maybe add a young guy. I don't think they're gonna I don't think that's gonna happen, but I'd like to see that happen. Um, and, I, I, I feel then, like Daiki would, would be fun with those guys. I'm ready for him to be in a unit period. I am so into the work Daiki's doing right now. Yeah, you know, Daiki and Fuda. You know, I mean, Junior, obviously, when he comes back, you know, who knows if that's sooner, you know, if that's in the summer, or if that's beyond summer. You know, Junior will obviously be an important piece when he comes back. And, you know, Daiki and, you know, Fuda, you know, they'll eventually have to join up with someone. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what what happens with, you know, Gold Class and Natural Vibe coming out of Nagoya and going into, going into the summer. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I'm... I, in terms of gold class, I mean, I'm ready from. It looks like Minorita's relatively healthy. He's moving around again. Um, he is still a ways away. He said that. Hang on, let me get exactly what he said. There is a show in. Show at the end of. End of this. At the end of May. Um, he's anyway. He's he's somewhere right now. Where is she? Because this week was a this week was a business trip week. So oh, she was in uh, Nagaoka, and there was a show in Nagaoka on May 29th. And he said he is not going to be ready for that unless there's a miracle. Oh damn! So um, again, Pinarita. So yeah, I'm still injured, and unless there is a, an absolute miracle, I won't I won't be on that show. So, his exact words. So, so it's he, it's him out, and Nagano's out, Revolution's out. Have you have you heard updates on any of those guys? Um, Nagano broke his neck. Um, Nagano blew out his knee, broke his collarbone, and broke his neck last year. Good lord. So, um, you know, it's going to be hard for him. Um, and then uh, Yoshioka, what just popped up, he was, he, he and Daya hung out, and uh, he's, you know, Yoshioka says it's going to take a little bit more, a little bit more time. So it's going to take a little bit more time for him. You know, it took the same injury as, Kato, as uh, Dirty Cop Kato last year. And Kato was out six, six months, seven months, and you know we're only five months in right now. So I think maybe summer, maybe around world, might be a time that we start thinking about Yoshioka again. Um, and then everyone else, um, there's no news until there's news. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Uh, one other question before we get to Dead or Alive, because we were talking about old guys just a second ago. Did you read the Mochizuki book that came out, and was there anything? any fun anecdotes that you picked up on there if you did? Because I didn't see a lot of English translations come out of that, and I was disappointed by that. I never got around to buying it, actually. Okay. Um, I, it's like, honestly, I could probably still... Yeah. I, I, items in your shopping cart. <laughs> yeah, <not> still. <laughs> still, still, sitting, still sitting there. Um, I'll, pick, I'll pick it up one of these days. It's not, I don't have 
Yeah, yeah. No, if you if you read that and find anything interesting, please share because I I was hoping somebody out there would have it read and and at least share some some passages from it. But I I have not heard much about it other than people that that speak Japanese saying, yeah, it was it was enjoyable. But that's all I got out of it. Yeah, I don't. Uh, if it was an audio book, I'd be much more inclined to inclined to get it. But like the paper, like the paperback book, I don't know. It's a tough sell in twenty twenty four. On, yeah, it's on sale. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll get around to it. I will get around to it. But um, no, no, no promises on that one. <laughs> Understood. I wonder if he would be the one narrating his book at the at this point. I feel like he should. You know, like... yeah, he's got he's got a he's got a good voice for it. Um, let's see. So there's, there's one review. Let's see. I'm I'm a Mochizuki Junior fan, and I'm As a, as a junior fan and someone who's familiar with both father and son, I think I thought the book was incredibly interesting. Okay. Reviewed in Japan on January 1st, 2024. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> one, of these, one of these days. Like, say, like you're reading a paperback book, like reading an entire paperback book in Japanese is still, like, even though I know I could do it, like, you know, it doesn't sound fun me yeah that's fair so, you know like it'd be it'd be better if i could just take the whole book and dump it into detail and read it and then go back when i and when there's something that doesn't make sense go back and read, read the japanese because you know if i was younger and i didn't live and work in japanese i'd be much more inclined to do stuff like this but like the amount of living living in japanese i want to do when i'm outside when it's outside of the, the survival level like i just don't want to do it anymore you know like before i came to japan all of the gaming i did you know i was i would just import the games and play them in japanese and it was totally fine but like i have no time for that now like i fucking atlas doesn't put out like it puts out it puts it releases its games simultaneously worldwide but with dual language in every region but japan and even with the fucking record setting historic low yen i just can't i can't be bothered and i have to go and by the US version for 50% markup just because I can't be bothered to play it in Japanese anymore. <laughs> I, I mean, sometimes you come to the point in your life that you go dubs over subs. And, you know, it, 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 I, I, could t- I could totally get like needing to disconnect and be like, all right, I need to turn off that part of my brain that has to be on at, at least 12 hours a day. Yeah, like I, I, I don't want to be bothered at all with it like i just cannot i can't engage with it at all um like i, I watched uh shogun on hulu though in in japanese and like i was surprising i was surprised that i was able to follow along with it because they're they're speaking in like old old samurai japanese so that, that was good to know that i could if i really needed to but at the same time i don't don't want to at all no i i, I totally get that so Dead or Alive is coming up this week. Uh, just before we get into the the, the matches themselves, uh, how are you feeling? Like I, I know that you said that that things are feeling a little optimistic going into Aichi. We're seeing the return of the cage match, the Nagoya, since the first time since COVID. Uh, uh, well, what are your thoughts moving into the uh, the traditional start of the hot season with uh, the big Golden Week show in Nagoya? Um. You know, it does look like it's going to kick off a lot of. There's a lot of different threads that could be picked up from this, not just in the cage match, but on you know on the undercard. You know, stuff that's going on with Minora and Yamato, and uh, you know, there's oh, what, is gonna, what is on the show. You know, the stuff with Strong Machine J, the stuff with UT. Um, you know, we've got a really strange Dreamgate Championship match. Yeah, that, we haven't um, we haven't talked to you since Valletta came into the company. Well, I mean, I, I I look at the Dreamgate match as I say this before it happens. I I have the right to reverse opinion as to if it's a disaster, but I think it's a real triumph that they've been able to squeeze all of uh, Valletta that they've been able to. You know, I'm excited for that match, even if there's a twenty percent chance it's a train wreck. Yeah, no, he's super over. Um, because you know he's it's that's something that. You know, these 
these kids at our shows have never seen before. You know, we can look at it and say, okay, well, he's doing he's doing the Brody thing. Like these people have no idea who Bruiser Brody is. And for a lot of these people that became fans during COVID, they've been sitting quietly with no wrestlers coming near them. And now there's this gigantic, insane foreign guy speaking Maltese at them and swinging chains around. You know, I mean, it's like talking, particularly when you go to like these small towns where who who don't see a foreigner <laughs> for you know. <laughs> In every in everyday life, you know it's 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 been a pretty it's been a pretty big win for that. Who's do you um, know whose idea it was to add the siren before his entrance? Because that really took it over the top for me. I think that's such a brilliant idea. Yeah, yeah. Without um, having to make him his own entrance music, just giving the you know, giving the warning noise. It's, uh, it's a nice it's a nice touch. It's a nice touch. We'll have to see how he does like a, a proper you know big show entrance with like the ramp and everything or whether he comes through the crowd or you know tumbles spills off the apron and throws the young boys around and it'll be interesting i mean he, I, he said you know probably biggest match of his career so you know he's going to be dialed in for this yeah but, no it's 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 crazy i mean i i can't believe i can't believe they're finish, doing right? it because the the risk there is so high because you know worst case scenario it it makes Monte ice cold and it cools off whatever aura Valletta had, is but there's the also a chance scenario? for a huge win. Is that the worst case scenario or is the worst case scenario? No contest and a vacated title. Oh boy. Uh, didn't even <laughs> consider that, uh, that, that possibility, <laughs> but now that's going far cl- up my list. Uh, possible bad returns. I mean, like, like we, well, we've been having happen. issues. It it happens, and you go to intermission, and you put the cage up, and you have an emotional ending, and you know people forget about it. And then you've got, you know, whatever. You have a, a tournament with the finals ending at World and the guarantee of a new champion with a champion who never got beaten and a foreigner who could potentially come back with a claim to a claim to the championship. You know, it could go that way. Um, I hope it doesn't, but it could. Well, it's it's funny you say that because before the full card came out, we were talking about where that Dreamgate match was going to be because you have to do the intermission before the cage, obviously. But I was making the argument that it should go Dreamgate, Twingate, intermission, cage, because if for some reason the Dreamgate match does bomb, that would be a really unpleasant and uncomfortable well, intermission. Well, people aren't going to go home. I mean... <laughs> And you, you you put the Twin Gate where it is because then, well, if it goes bad, then you say, okay, Dragon Kid and Ruki Doi, new Twin Gate champions, autograph signing over here. <laughs> yeah. and everybody goes, you know, and everybody and you know everybody goes over there, and uh, they're going to be a Twin Gate title match. Alejandro is injured, isn't he? I, I yes, I just saw that. He has like a he has like a spine injury or something. I, like a, when a, he, he got pulled off the the Noah show yesterday. Yikes! Which um, is a bummer it, because. I've never seen somebody that isn't in Dragon Gate seemingly so desperately want to be in Dragon Gate. Like Alejandro just fits in seamlessly, I think. Yeah, really shape. We got a cervical a cervical contusion, and because of that, we are well, they're just pulling him as a precaution, not because he's got like a championship match coming up. I think they're just pulling him as a precaution to make sure he's healthy for their, their May fourth show. But yeah, that'd be something. That'd be something. He couldn't make the match, and then, you know, the, they only get the titles because someone got injured, and now he gets injured to make the titles back with nothing, with no net positive in between. That would be that would be something. Yeah, there's no other Noah Junior that I'd want to see replace him. Also, that's the problem. There's not like a quick fix substitute of I'll give so and so a call. Yeah, that I mean, who does who who does he? Who does Kiyomiya team with normally? Like I, you know, the image that he teams with the the young boy from uh, New Japan. Yeah, that's my thought as well. I don't, I don't follow Noah closely enough to know if he has another tag partner. Uh, well, I'm just I'm looking at looking at the card that Alejandro got pulled from, and he's teaming with with him and Ohara and their uh, Owada, no, young the young boy Owada. Yeah, he yeah, was really... at uh, Buyaden that in the yeah, six man. Yeah, I mean, fuck it, bring him. That'd be fun. I, I really, you know, I'm, I've, I've said on the show a number of times, you know, I'm really not a big Kiyomiya guy, but I can't believe that when he's in the ring in Dragon Gate, he's as giving as he is, and 
you know, doesn't work like this promotion is beneath him, which was my initial concern when they did the angle to set up the match at final gate was that he was going to kind of loaf his way through it. And, you know, we'd just have this awkward twin gate match. But I, I think, you know, there was stuff in Ray Day Parejas that surpassed it. But in terms of just matches I enjoyed the most, Kiyomi and, I, and Alejandro versus uh, Kung Fu Masters on Bayside, that from personal enjoyment has been maybe my favorite match of the year. Yeah, it was a good match. It was a good match. Um, you know, I want it. I want it to be over just because I'm tired of there not being you know opportunities to have Twin Gate matches and not having you know guys carrying the belts around on on our shows. But you know, for something that's been kind of thrown together that wasn't supposed to happen, you know, I think that I think that they've done their best with it. I think so too. Um, I think it's I'm. I mean, it's turned into a nice little gonna, angle. He's going to be IW. He's going to be GHC champion. I mean, I mean, he's got a title match that it looks like he's going to win. Right, um, the day before, so he might be GHC champion. So coming coming into the show, so that's you know, kind of a big deal. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a going Dragon Kid getting the win, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's the end of it. I'm sure there'll be no follow up, and you know, nobody wants there to be follow up. But yeah, I mean, for something that's been thrown together, and it's it's been fine for sure. So we've we've got that, which again, I'm very excited about. I like this Dragon Kid Doi team a lot. You know, I, I like I just told you, I'm into the Kiyomiya thing. Uh, we talked about the Dreamgate match a little bit, but I want to go back to that before we get to the cage. I I was very frustrated with the way that Monte got the title. I found the three-way match to be ill-advised. I found the fact that he won the three-way match to be even more ill-advised. But the strong Skywalker match, the strong Yokosuka match, and then a really, what I thought was a really, really strong outing in Ray Day Prejas. I, I've now bought into him as champion again, even though he kind of lost me when he won the belt. What are your thoughts on Monte as a champion and Big Hug as a collective unit right now? Um, I mean, they need more members. You know, I think they've been a two-man team for a bit too long. And, you know, they want, they want Kame, whether they get Kame, you know, we'll see. I mean, I, if, I, if I was them, I would be looking... I was looking for backup plans, you know, to find to find another member. Um, but no, I mean he's been, he's been good. I mean he looks he looks like a champion. Wrestles like a, wrestles like a champion, and um, you know he's a good guy. He's come in. He, he's put. He's, you can't say he hasn't put the work in. Um, no God, no, no. I mean I I, I feel it, and you know it's kind of like I love the YouTube uploads so much. I'm so glad they've continued to do those because. You've got your guys that maybe killed on every Corkin and, you know, Fukuoka and Kobe, they they show up and they work hard. But I always like to keep a tab of who's really working hard on the house shows. And over the last six months, you know, I think Monte and Hyo have busted their ass every time they're on camera, whether it's, you know, the televised show or the YouTube show. Sure. Uh, yeah, the, I, I could agree go with ahead. that. Yeah, I, I, I could agree with that 100%. For sure. Uh, let's talk about the cage match here. You know, this is what the first time they've done a cage since 2021 in Aichi. And I was telling Mike, uh, you know, for the show we recorded this past week, this is the most excited I've been for a show since the two nights of world in 2021. And, you know, I'm into the Twin Gate stuff. I'm into the Dream Gate stuff. But this cage match is, is really firing on all cylinders for me right now. Yeah, you know, it's... It's the first time in a while that there's been. I mean, the, the cage match last year at World obviously had a lot, a lot of stake going into it. But this, but you know that one at, at the end of the day, you always kind of knew who was, who was going to be left in the cage at the end. It, yeah, you know, there, there were there were five guys there, but it was a cage match that mattered really to two guys. Yeah, and you know this time there's a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of different guys who could lose this, you know. Um, KZ could lose. You know, he's out of natural vibes if he does, but, you know, that could be something, you know, that could be a, a positive thing for everybody else in the unit. You know, Kame, you know, Kame could lose because, you know, he's, he was there to protect him, KZ's there to protect him, but both of them at the end of the day will, could be looking out for themselves, and then Kame could get caught in the crossfires of that. Skywalker, probably not going to lose, but you never know. Um, you know, Kyo is in there to protect Kame, so if he want, if he has to stick around as long as Kame does, that could bite him in the ass. And then, you know, Jason, you know, Jason's fresh turn deal, but he's got to deal, you know, 
his ally in the match is Skywalker, which means it's a minus. For, for you. <laughs> so he has no ally in the match. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so if he's if he's going in thinking that he's gonna have a reliable partner to, you know, take out KZ or take out Kame or whatever, you know, because Skywalker wants to, to make sure KZ loses, Lee wants to make sure Kame loses, Sho is in there to protect Kame. You know, at the end of the day there's so many conflicting conflicting goals in here that um you know, you don't really know which way it could go. And then you've all, you've also got to consider Machine J and UT earlier in the night because, you know, Machine J hasn't been dealing, hasn't been helping them with anything. So if he just goes in and, you know, sweeps UT, beats him and leaves, does that inspire him to come out and help later on? You know, if UT gets gets beat, you know, maybe he's not available for, for the cage match at the end. You know, there's... Um, a lot of intrigue about this match. And it's something that Jason and this heel turn and the way that they kind of got us to uh, having a steel cage survival match. I think it's something where like I find myself like last year, the everything was like the summation of Monte's uh, tenure to Dragon Gate at that. And, and it kind of, as you're saying, as y'all were saying, the match was really about two people, and we knew kind of what was happening at the end of the day. The, the, I would think that Jason kind of walks into the match kind of as the favor, as one of the favorites to lose. But he's been such a, it's been such a like breath of fresh air and such a needed thing to have him turn and turn in the way he did. It was something where I look at the Steel Cage Survival match and how how the history of these matches have gone and and in a lot of ways this one feels like such a uh for lack of better phrase such of like a return to tradition and that there's not a whole lot of like the hostage situations and the shenanigans and robo mochi here instead we have what i think was one of the really strong uh turns that they've had in recent memory especially with the way that jason turned and how he's portrayed himself ever since it's been he's become instantly like the most interesting person on screen whenever he's in a match yeah i mean he there hasn't been a a feel like him in a long time you know when we got to like later stage red and even you know zebrat during this entire time it's either been like you know little shit feels or you know high in Ishin style, you know, drag around, drag around the the arena, cheating type of deal. So having, you know, like uh, someone who could beat you convincingly even before they kick you in the dick type of heel, um, Skywalker side, obviously, but, you know, just that alone has been pretty invigorating to uh, to Zebrath. We need the entire unit to be healthy because even when they have five members, they only have three members on the cards at a given time. But, you know, when they get back to full power, you know, I think they'll be much more interesting than they than they have been over the last 18 months. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's so nice to see Jason shine the way he has. One, his his look reminds me of Makoto, like Crazy Max era Makoto, which I really like, but also... You know, it's just it, when you think about it, the last few heel turns, it was Ishin who was relatively young and it was Kato who was very young. And then before that, you have to go back to Shun. So even just the, it, it sounds crazy to say in Dragon Gate, but the novelty of this heel turn is is there and present. And then, you know, the work that he and Kamei have done ever since the turn. I just I, I'm like I told you, I'm I'm as into this as anything in a few years. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree totally. And you know, he's somebody that's been around for a really long time and really good for a long time, but hasn't been. You know, I mean, there's guys that haven't been healed since when he came in in what 2017. Yeah, so, in 2017. And, you know, there's plenty of guys that have not been a heel since 2017, but there are guys that were not that were probably never going to be a heel again. So this is you know this is the first time there's been a guy who's been a baby face for forever that all you've known of him is as, is as a baby face. So finally, now you get to see another side of him and it's not a novelty, you know, it's a, 
in terms of, you know, it's a kind of a haha type heel turn, you know, like when Yamato puts the pain under his eyes or whatever, you know, like this is like real. We're, we're getting a completely new side of this guy who we've only seen one side of for, you know, seven years at this yeah. point. So I, I was telling Mike a few weeks ago that I feel like, you know, we're hearing more noise from the crowd uh, off of the Jason and Kamei stuff. And, and, you know, Hyo, I think, has been such a revelation in the, in the way that he's connected with the crowd. But I'm hearing uh, Kamei crowd calls now when he's in the ring with Jason that remind me of a it's bygone era. And that's been very refreshing. It's the same girl at every show. Oh, really? <laughs> It's the same girl at every show, yeah. The one, the one that like really annoyed Doi at uh, <laughs> whatever the show, whatever, whatever the the Kobe show. She was in the front row, just just screaming Pami's name over and over again, and Doi finally broke down and was like yelling at her. <laughs> no, it's, it's same, girl. same girl at every show. But um, that's what you want. I mean, you want fans that are that invested that they want to come to every single show and doubt for Kame. Oh my 65, god, yeah. You know, 60 times in a minute. You know, that's that's you know, that obviously means that something is working. So, um keep, keep doing it. Keep doing it. it. It real quick in terms of Kame, this is uh you know, slightly related, but I I'm just curious because I've never really heard him talk about his influences. Was he a a Dragon Gate kid like say UT was where he grew up going to shows or how did he find his way into the promotion? I have no idea. You know, I've never really talked to Kame that much, but I think he was just probably a Dragon Kid fan because he's a little, you know, he was little. So that's and usually, that, that seems to be the trend for everybody in wrestling nowadays. Yeah, that's you know, if it's a small guy that comes to Dragon Gate, it's most likely because of uh, because of Dragon Kid. I'm glad he's here. I, I I have said numerous times now. You know, the the running for best wrestler in the world. It's it's Danielson. It's Osprey. And then there's a very wide gap, but I would have Kamei in that number three position right now. Yeah, he's super good. He's he's incredibly good. You know, he's got that he's got that Horiguchi energy where, you know, he, Oh yeah. He's little, he gets beat up, he gets thrown around. Um and he ha you know, he has the advantage of having opponents like Monte and Skywalker who he is super compatible with. So it makes him seem stronger than he really is but that's what you want i mean that's what pro wrestling is making people look stronger than they actually are so i mean he's he's yeah I, he's probably the best in the company right now at everything they just need to put they just need to give him a run with something and well just, do you think they're going to do he and he and monte in a Dreamgate match based off the the opening night of the tag league you don't know where you could do it um, I mean, like, it, I guess you could do it in Corican and June. Yeah, it feels like a Corican defense. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see. You know, we'll see where he is after the cage match. We'll see where Monte is after the title match. Um, you know, it's certainly vi it's certainly a viable thing. I mean, this is, this kind of comes back to the previous discussion about the loss of, you know, losing venues. Like that's a perfect match to do in like Pakata Star Lanes or like that that size venue, but yeah, you know, it's either it's either Corican or a major show for Dreamgate matches, so it's more likely to be a Corican match. But I shit, I wouldn't mind it. Do it. And it's something like with Kamei, you brought it up, up like his kind of understudying of Ginky Horiguchi. It's been such a rele just a relevation, just the way that Mon uh, we've seen Kamei like go from essentially being the guy who gets to watch all of the Horiguchi, Susumu, and KZ matches, and then having like the best education in in a way to become this character that he is now. And it, it it's something where, it, in a way, I feel like his limiter has been taken off since the uh as the beginning of like a Ray de Parejas and then the Jason turn and. I, I, I know that the Corkin defense makes uh, a lot of sense, and especially like I don't think they've done a Corkin def they haven't done a Corkin defense for Monte as well. I just I, I wonder if it's something where with like his popularity at this point and with the unit landscape being so shaky, like I would be intrigued by what you could do with the idea of him being a unit leader at this point. Can't talk. So that, but if you but you put him with someone who can, and you know, then you've got you've got something. 
So um, it would all depend on who the people in his unit are. Um, well, let's see. Let's put him with. I mean, I mean, what do you think? I mean, with him with Big Hug, what do you guys think? If you were to join with them, I it it would be something where like the at least for me. The, the magic of Big Hug is that Hyo is the most Teflon person possible. That, like, he is just, like, I, I don't wonder about needing, really, the, the, them needing, like a, like, a real young guy as a loss post because, like, Hyo has shown, like, yeah, he's a Brave Gate champion, and in the Big Hug matches, he will take, like, losses and that. And that I think the, the, the fun with uh, Kame, though, into it is not with him being like coming in and like being like the third person in the unit. I think that you kind of get to see a Monte Hyo pair or Monte Kame pairing. And at post Dreamgate for Monte, I think that they really should see what you could do with that tag team and just not and be able to like keep the belts on them for a while. Like that's that would be my big hope coming out of the unit. I think he fits in pretty well, and it's something where Hio has such a presence now with the audience that you can get away from Kame being shaky on on the mic at this point. I I, sure. I just wonder like what would be the next step from there because if you do the three, then you're still going to have to figure out who between uh Kame and Hio's are dropping falls. Then. Sure. I I'm resistant to it just because I feel like Kame has already rejected them so many times that the thought of him now joining them is just very strange to me. I can't get on board with that. I would much rather see Kame out on his own with his own unit. And then you just find that number two that can hopefully help him out vocally with the promos. Sure. Yeah, or maybe I he know, stays in vibes. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe KZ loses and, and Kame takes over vibes. I don't know. Yeah, do you want to, do you think natural vibe still ha needs to be around? This is where my head's at is I is I actually I think Casey's losing and I think vibes is going away, but I think it's really hard to underestimate how important familiarity is, especially when business isn't on fire and it's not that vibes is, you know, the most overact the company's ever had, but they are immediately recognizable, and the second and third generations of the unit have been really enjoyable, and I I struggle to come up with an argument that they should go away, because I think, all in all, they've been such a net positive over the last few years, but I don't think Kamei's losing his hair, I don't think Hyo's losing his hair, I don't think Jason's losing his hair, and I don't think Shun's losing his mask, which points the fingers now at KZ. Yeah, uh, do you think the the argument about having them as the familiar faces on the show still stands when you have a unit with Yamato, Dragon Kid, Susumu, and Doi on on the table now? That's that's an interesting thought. I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that, but that I you know I I, I don't know. You tell me is is having a dancing unit integral to the day-to-day -day of the promotion or are there people that might be might be bummed out if there's not a dancing unit there um i think if you asked me this question a year ago i'd say you still needed to have the dancing unit but now i don't know i don't know i think people want to see machine j and shimizu do something else um and you know kz could slide in with yamato dragon kid and those guys that would be um, an interesting veterans unit if KZ wound up there. I would I would yeah. like that. You know, KZ and Hulk wind up there and then you reshuffle the, the parts of Gold Class and Natural Vibes and you know, Big Hug, you know, somewhere within the parts of that you make you make two more un you make two units out of that. Do you think Shimizu could slide in a big hug because his name is Big Boss? Um, I you know, I don't know. I don't think so. I see if there's anyone else I think like Benkei and Minorita would make sense over there. Minorita not as Minorita anymore as something else. Um, you know, maybe Machine J and Shimizu then go and do they do their own thing with you know whoever that if you know if Natural Labs were to break up. I mean, this could very well be you know the the moment where you know machine j sees the light comes back makes the big save at the end and make sure make sure everybody gets out and you know now then necrobides is you know back to normal 
Mike, I, I, I'm curious. Yeah. What, what are what are your thoughts on this cage match? Because this is our preview show, and I yeah. don't I don't really know where you stand on this. I initially was thinking that it would be Jason losing because I don't think that his heel turn would hurt at all by losing the hair. Actually, I think his look would look even better with like the the, the shave head. I think it actually kind of makes him look even more diabolical. I think that that would look at least great coming out of it, but. I'm now really intrigued by the idea of KZ and natural vibes breaking up, basically. Because if you think about it, like you have gold class and the shuffling and the shuffling, but at what point is the shuffling going to stop there with them? And if you move out Ben and Hulk, then I think you have like an interesting possibility with uh, Mino and uh, Jay and Shimizu as a trio. I think that there could be something there with that. But it, but but all of that basically precludes the idea that KZ has to get his head shaved. But it, it it's something where I feel like that you have kind of people in positions in this match that like Shun is the zero percent. Like okay, if Shun's losing his mask, something had to happen in that match for it to have to to force that to happen. Like some things had to go so super wrong there. And Kame, I think. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid we might get a Yamato situation if we cut that hair, Jay. I, I, I think that it'll be something where everyone's going to go like, oh, we should wait for him to grow that hair back. So it's Ooh, something where I think it's just like the, the, the rational conclusion and also the chaos option is the one to go to. And if we're going to see like the veteran unit kind of take over the familiarity role that natural vibes and M3K in ways were holding up for most of the last uh, two years, I think that uh, we are team veteran returns, whatever is kind of the way to do that. And then you don't need natural vibes then for people like, uh, I, I, as y'all are saying, Jay and uh, uh, K and Kame can really get their move on and get ready for a new thing. So I really do feel like that. And Jay UT, is, don't forget about UT. I, I mean, UT, I, I feel like UT in a, in a way is going to one way or another end up being in the veteran army if this happens. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think he might end up being the key person on this on this show. You know, we'll see what happens. You know, that's true. He is, that are... he has somehow become the afterthought, and he is really very important to this. You're right. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's usually the people that are the loudest that about one thing that you know, it's always projection, right? Um. So, you know, he's the one that's talking the loudest about keeping natural vibes together. You know, who knows? Who knows what he means by that? You know, that could mean something else entirely. So, um, I don't know anything, but so I'm just just saying, you know, that that might be more than just there might be more to that singles match with Machine J. The plot thickens. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I seriously, I'm not hinting. I'm not <laughs> trying to drop. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I don't know. Like I, I don't know anything that's going on on this show. Uh, but, let me let me fire my DraftKings account real quick, Jay. Who who's going over a match three since you have so much intel on the main event? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we uh, we've is, got to get is, our DraftKings up on going on it. What <laughs> what is what is, what is match three on this show? Probably. Oh, that's the that's the eight man with uh, D Courage um, and Ultimo. I mean, probably Kimata, right? Or Kanda getting pinned by. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I go either way because you know, Rioya, it might not be time for Rioya to get a win over one of these guys yet. Man, it certainly feels like it, though, with the work he's doing. I mean, what a what a few months he's had. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think I think last time we talked was right after he debuted. And uh, when we were, then we were talking about, you know, the Blaze Brothers leaving and, you know, that, you know, it's fine. <laughs> that, you know. Dude is dude is leaving because we've got Rioya and Rioya can do everything that he can do, and it's you know and it's perfectly fine. And you know, and he's, he's more handsome. And he's he's done. You know, I think he's lived up. He's lived up to that. So you know, nothing nothing but praise for how far Rioya has come. And he's you know he's perfect example of what happens when you. And this is this is the same as Kame. You know, like you said with Kame, that like he got to go be in a team with. Susumu and Horiguchi and KZ and wrestle every night, travel every night with those guys. And he just got good doing that. 
And uh, Rioja is the same thing. You know, he has to get thrown out into the deep end, and he has to be teaming, but particularly with Yoshioka out now, and that he's got to do a lot more heavy lifting on these shows. If they want to do a six-man tag, he's got to be in those, and he's gotten really good because of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what they're go- what. Um, the idea is for Decourage if they're just going to holding pattern until Yoshio comes back or if they're going to run with Ryoya or a triangle gate. You know, I mean, the two knows there's no triangle gate match on this show. There's no wave gate match on this show. So, you know, you can have him get a win here and that could lead to a challenge somewhere. Or he, hey. could, just get all, he, could, he could just get slapped by Fuji and then, you know, elbow dropped and pinned. <laughs> absolutely hey we might be on the road to uh open the brave gate uh ho ho lun defeating against uh defending against Royo tanaka and for the record well, i'm for it yeah i mean look i mean yo could be you know yo could be bald bald and defeated heading into hong kong you know it's it you know ho ho's on a ho ho's on the run of his life so you know don't Oh, you know, in his, you know, plus the hometown boost. You imagine a hometown boost versus bald guy um, versus a hit from you know losing losing the hair. I mean, it could happen. I am okay. anxiously awaiting a ho ho Jason singles match in Kobe. I'm a little surprised they didn't do it this this most recent time around. That just feels like it's the next logical step with Jason's heel turn. Yeah, yeah. I thought the logical thing would be like. Um, Kung Fu Master, like they just do like Kame and Koho come out as Kung Fu Masters, and then Jason comes out, and you know you do the thing to end, you know, to put the graceful end to to that whole deal. But maybe that maybe that has to wait until after the Hong Kong show because Ho Ho's got Ho-Ho's in the middle of a big push. It, it, um, I I just thought about this when we were going over the injuries because I've had a few people ask me, and I I obviously don't know. Uh, Shinlog, Maria, what's her health status at? Will we see her in the ring again? Yosuke, I mean, back injury in, you know, whatever, end of 2022. Yeah. Um, you know, there was no news since then. There's, um, like, Estrella's been teaming with some random loot person in a cat mask in Mexico so people were thinking that maybe that was Yosuke but it's not Yosuke so um and you know they were just on I guess um putting a t-shirt out so I I, but I don't I mean I don't know I have no idea if Yosuke is ever going to be back or not interesting yeah I mean you know it was a pretty obviously you know lower back injury you know I don't know if there was surgery or, you know, if, what happened, but I mean, hasn't been at shows or anything like in Kobe, um, but is alive, you know, when on on their birthday, they were, you know, thank you for all the birthday wishes, still in character and everything. And there's a, you know, putting a new t-shirt out, so live, whether they're coming back or not, I have no idea. Well, it's nice to hear they're alive at the very least. Yeah. I mean. Fucking Konami Chikawa, nobody's heard from this year. I was just looking at it at, at his cage match. I didn't realize he hadn't wrestled all year. Nobody's seen him. Well, that's that's a man I need a wellness check on. I hope he's doing okay. Yeah, I mean, I know, and that's one of the things you don't you don't you don't realize it until <laughs> someone says it. Yeah, I had no idea that he's been gone all year until you brought it up, Jay. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if he's hurt. Or, or if there's a situation where you know what it is, the the, the show must go on, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, even without going to Mami Chikawa, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mike, is there yeah, anything I, else you want to hit on this Dead or Alive card? Yeah, I wanted yeah. to touch on uh, Toru Awashi coming back and teaming with uh, Big Boss Shimizu. Oh, Jay, we've been doing kind of every month. For the 25th anniversary, we've kind of gone back and picked a topic or a uh, show to do. Last week, we did El Numero Uno 2004, and it was probably the the biggest like stark reminder of like seeing Awashi around now and then seeing him 2004, just like how like just different he was on that roster. And 
yeah uh, i just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on awashi in his last like full-time full-time year in pro wrestling coming back home and at least splitting time here um my first thought was okay we we just got rid of mck we were finally going to be down one muted muted audio segment on the show and now awashi's back that was my first thought <laughs> <laughs> but, but at least you get second, sandstorm in the building yeah but you know it's it's you know everybody is welcome to come back home you know um i think maybe fans that aren't familiar with the history or are only coming in for the matches probably you know aren't gonna aren't gonna be too thrilled with it that's gonna be a skippable segment for them but you know him coming back around you know m more than welcome you know more than welcome um, would love to see him and him and Kage were standing together. And I looked at him, I said, "Oh, Animal Planet." And I'm like, "No, nobody, nobody remembers that." Laughing, you know, laughing is like, <laughs> like embarrassing. You can get, you know, get Owaki, get Kage. You can get, I don't know, you can get Go. He's an animal. You can get uh, Ryufuda. He's a dragon. You could do like a new Animal Planet theme. Like, I'd be, I'd be all for that. Ah, we got to get you the pencil, Jay. That's a great idea. Yeah. Make a new new uh, young boy Aki, and you, know, you can we can make him like Bear Sahara or something, because you know, he's a football guy. You know. What are what are your impressions on those new future kids? Is there anything we should know about them? Um, Pato Homare Pato is by all accounts a standout. He's the one that has that they are uh, really really high on, like really really high on him. Um. Sahara is going to be a power guy, you know. So he's going to be he's going to be unique just because he's going to be a new big guy that comes in. Um, the other two, I don't know. Um, the Koki, he, he's you know he was in uh, Rioya's class, but he got injured, so he had to go away for a while and then come back. Um, not not sure not sure about him i think he's going to get chances because he's from, he's from he's from hokkaido so they're going to give him every chance in the world but um i think in terms of expectations i'm not expecting too much from him uh tsujiguchi i don't really know too much don't know, don't know too much about him he was the one that was in the mask the angle okay um, but i mean kato is going to be the one the one to look for from this group and then if the, if the other guy if the other guys are good, then it's just, it's just extra because apparently apparently Pato is is that good. Wow, but, is it something but, where you know, like he is so far he, ahead? Like I, I at least in recent classes, even though there were like okay Tanaka last year, like we knew that there was the documentary and there was a lot of hope behind him. It it it, it, it does feel like that. I, from the way that you're talking about Kato, and I mean, I noticed on the song, uh, on the Art Center shows, like he did kind of look a little bit ahead of everyone else on there. Uh, is that this does feel kind of like the first time in a couple of years where there seems to be that level of delineation? Yeah, yeah, and you know, a lot of it is because he's good looking. I'll be uh, to be to be real about it, but I guess he can, you know, he can move really well. He can chop really hard. He looks really good. I mean, kind of similar to Rioya. In, in that and I think kind of a good complete package of you know everything that you would want in a Dragon Gate wrestler. He still has to make it to his debut. He still has to debut. He still has to wrestle for 20 years. <laughs> so let's not put too much pressure on him. But out of, out of this class, he's, he's the one that has the most expectations behind him. That is good to know. Jay, I have one more question for you, uh, at least before I'm out of questions, which is back to Awashi for a second. Do you know if his anniversary show, if that ever got released on DVD or if that's out there anywhere? It, it, it is now, yes. Okay. Um, I just saw a post from him that um, pre-orders are out. Like every, every, anyone who pre-ordered, they've shipped, and now it's up for regular sale. So if you go if you go to his, his Twitter account, there will be... Uh, He's got a link there. Okay, I will. I will check that out. That looked like a very fun show. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was interesting that uh, that's probably the only place we're going to get Pescatori this year. So, yeah, wanted, Pescatori wanted... and, and Ken Oka on the same team. What a what a powerhouse duo that is. They're well, they're from the same class. You know, they're from them and brother and Chachi and. Uh, 
you know, they're all from the the seventh class. That's all their, you know, teammates. Or they were all, or they came into the came into the the Mexico dojo together. That's crazy. Yeah. Did Oka there... actually make it to Mexico? Because I thought I heard that he ran away before that. Um, he, um, I don't know if he went to Mexico or not. I think he did run away before that, but he was in the same class with those guys. So like Owaki, brother, uh, Satsuki, Yagi, you know, they were all, they, they all came in together. So they, they dormed together long enough to form a bond. Well, I think that does it for uh, questions we had for you, Jay. Did you have a- any other things you wanted to touch on before we got out of here this morning or your evening? Um. All right, well, let me ask you guys. So let me get the vibe check from you guys then. I mean, what's, uh, what, what's the discourse been like these days? I mean, aside from, you know, I know people like the ETU show, but otherwise, I mean, are people... People excited. People talking about stuff. You getting you getting more clicks or you know whatever. What's what, what's the uh, what's the internet vibe check? People like Kame. Yeah. yeah. It, it 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 seems like that. At, at least from the things that we can determine, like I, I I feel like that this year versus last year, there's there's been more new interest, but I don't know if that's for for a lot of at least internet and international fans when they think about dragon gate and sometimes they think about the wild balls out cage matches and i don't know necessarily if it's reflective of that because i i I feel like every single time that there is a steel cage survival match someone goes like oh it's a dragon gate cage match i need to get in on that and i I, it's so i feel like that it's up if only for that uh it, it does feel like at a time that I, I I totally get how everything like like Mania Week and what Mania Week and kind of developed. I just I, I I've kind of come to terms with the idea that uh, there was an era of WrestleMania weekend, and there was the the and in that era, Dragon Gate thrived, and at that era, there was also four or five shows over the weekend, and it just feels like that now every wrestler is doing four or five matches across that weekend, right. and that's kind of what made ETU so special was the fact that not only was it all Dragon Gate and a lot of, I, I would say, uh, Indies guys that at least I was a little bit more up on. And that kind of, at least for me, I like seeing that kind of stuff. And I like seeing the prospects, especially like Alec Price has been someone that I've been seeing for years. I've been wondering, wondering but like, hey, uh, if he finds his way over to Kobe, he'll be eating well, I, I feel like. Sure. But I, I, I'm pretty high on everything, and it does kind of feel like that interest is peaking up a little bit, Case. Would you say so? Well, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of it's it's funny just the way it worked out. I think in terms of the English-speaking audience, I think Dragon Gate was actually aided by the pandemic because I think a lot of people in 2020 and 2021 had more time on their hands to watch. And so I feel like we probably heard a little bit more from people then 2022 2023 we we shed some of those people just in terms of people watching dragon gate but ray day Parejas was really well received and you know on my end when dragon gate is good i try to let people know as much as possible and it just so happens that it seems like dragon gate might be peaking when new japan is tumbling downwards and all japan is is good but is cooled off and noah is no one you know I, every generation has a, a group of people that are burned by Noah. Uh, this one's no different, but it, it feels like there's a window there to really grab some people if Dead or Alive is as good as the show looks on paper. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope I hope that's the case. I hope that I hope that is the case. Um, someone <laughs> someone said to me um, before the, before the Mania weekend, you know, they were asking, like, so are you are you announcing anything? What are you doing? I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm announcing anything because both commentating on both of those shows didn't come together until like right right before right before the shows um for the dcw show the show was like the first match was going in the ring when we decided decided on it um i was like well it might be an opportunity you know to you know get your name out there and like god don't make me turn this plane around that's like the worst <laughs> sound in, in, in the world but at the, at the same time it's like well you know if it means more people get interested in you know watch the show then I'm sure i'll take the hit <laughs> but you know i hope it does i hope it does translate and you know any anybody that was 
peaked, had their input peaked by the by the ETU show, does end up coming in, or even you know, or any of the other matches that we can do, come in, you know, maybe check us out in May for you know, Dead or Alive or you know, whatever else is going on. Well, as I told you the last time you were on this show, you know, I I always feel like you're you know you're a reluctant commentator, like you very can much. take it or leave it, but you're very good at it. And you know, the ETU uh, show was well received, but specifically your commentary on the ETU show was very well received. And you know, like I told you last time, you know, I, I outside of promo translations, I'd be able to you know I can follow along without the commentary, but I prefer having you and Ho Ho. Because I, I think you guys add so much to it. Well, I got I got to put over uh, Iron Jack from ETU. Yes, he's, he was great. Uh, yeah, yeah y'all have fun chemistry. He is really yeah, and like I, hi, hi, nice to meet you. Shake your hand, okay? Climb up this ladder. Let's get down there. Um, and like I was only supposed to be up there for two matches, I think, and the other guy never came, so ended up doing the whole show. But uh, no, he he's like like. If there's anybody, if you're a promotion listening to this and you need a play-by-play guy, like look look this this kid up. He's young, he's super knowledgeable. Like, you know, he it was super good. Nothing but nothing but good things to say to say about uh, the Iron Zach. It was a really fun and, dynamic. And, and you know, Lenny, Lenny, and Dave too. Uh, I I uh, kind of felt bad, kind of jumping in, stepping in, and talking talking too much and. But, um, you know, I'm thankful that we were able to to work that out, too, um, that they just happened to have a third headset available for that show. Yeah, it, it, it was like a nice thing also. I mean, you, you, had, you, had, uh, you, you had, uh, sorry, I'm blanking on Lenny and uh, Dave do the Mania 2006 show and then into DG USA. And it felt like then having you alongside and having like that three man booth in a way, at least I would say for like the old diehards, it was like a nice, like going like, Hey, that's a nice bit of nostalgia there in a way. It would a bit of new with current uh, commentary. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, the original, originally, like we didn't know who was doing commentary. I kept asking a whole, Hey, can you ask them if I could do commentary on this map, please? And you know, obviously, getting an answer from getting an answer from DCW management right before WrestleMania weekend on something as minor as the commentary on the one Dragon Gate match on one of you know um, this one match out of ninety matches that are happening on your show. We didn't get an answer on that. We were all the way up through WrestleCon, and we still had no idea about this. And then, like, I saw Lenny, and I'm like, hey, you know, he's like, oh yeah, me and Dave are going to call the match. I'm like, oh okay, well, there's probably that probably means I don't have to do commentary on this. And then. Like, well, maybe they have a third, maybe they have a third headset. Then I saw Lenny in the hotel. I was like, hey, well, you know, if you guys have a third headset, he's like, oh, yeah, we do. I was like, do you mind? He's like, no, absolutely. Come on up and do it. So then we had to convince them to let me do it. But uh, I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad we, I'm glad we got to, I'm glad I got to call a match with Lenny, finally. Um, so that, that, that was cool. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, you know, come out and do commentary that much. So. No, so, he he does he I the only show I think he's gonna do this year is is spring break. That was it. Yeah, yeah, you know he and he you know he basically said he doesn't want to just do you know if he gets a call from you know someone, then he'll go he'll go and do it. But unless he you know you have something that is worth his time, but he's not just gonna come out and do you know whatever. And he, he shouldn't you know because I think he's he's earned he's earned that privilege to be able to kind of pick his shot on that and it's, it's probably the only opportunity that we've got to call message them so i'm glad we got to do it. no i'm very glad as well it was very nice yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Larry, larry larry dallas is at the etu show I had to had to keep keep guard at the bottom of the ladder make sure nobody came <laughs> no um he's doing triple mania tonight <laughs> is he still the triple x he does yeah yeah he's yeah, he wasn't you know he's he's going to school, getting his life together. So I'm I'm pulling I'm pulling for Larry. I last and, time I know. talked to him, he seemed to to be in a in a good state of Larry, which is always encouraging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Empire states of Larry, right? No, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> concrete jungle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Uh, that's right. I was gonna say something else. I lost my lost my train of thought on Larry. Oh yeah, is uh, what's his name? Is Kento 
on on Purple Mania? No. No. Not, I think Kento's he, back in Japan. Yeah, he posted a f- interesting photo on 420. Well, 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 that was an old photo. Okay. Because he's that yeah, because that was that post I was actually referencing on this because that was um you did the TV show where they did he did the, the dojo match with the young boy that didn't make it who just wanted to do have a wrestling match once in his life so they did a match in the dojo on a TV show and and that was on 420 last year and that's what that picture was from but in that same post he mentioned that he's got in a AAA contract but but I was wondering if that because I don't know what having a AAA contract means I don't know if AAA knows what that means. Yeah, like yeah. Not, you know, not just for him, but in general. Like I don't, like I don't understand what we like the politics of of lucha contracts. <laughs> so, right. Uh, like when I talk to folks about like that situation with them in AAA, it very much is like, hey, if it, I th- this was before like the contract news kind of came up, it was always like, uh, y- y- you know, it's not like that they're doing anything it's more that it's fill in work and i just can't see it being much more than that even it i guess is a contract saying that you will be a fill in guy i guess yeah what about what about the other guy is he, or, or do they sh- always show up together or are they separated from time to time over there when they're in mexico they're together all the time okay yeah um <laughs> you know I, it's it's funny just the way progression happens. I mean, Kento in Japan and in Mexico, I think since the split, he's kind of reasserted himself as like, okay, well, if there's a guy with potential from these two, it's him. You know, he he's done some stuff that I've that I've enjoyed in Taku. I, you know, it's just remarkable to to think about how we talked about him two years ago and now the output that he has now. It's just like a different human. That, it yeah. is. It really is. Do they, it, do they, his look is weird. They, like, he just looks like shit on camera. And I don't say that to be mean. It just, he looks like it, a guy who's not doing some. well. Yeah. 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 It's like actual Can't worry for him. Sorry, Jay? Um, I, I'll just, I'll leave that. What, I'll leave my comment to the, to the shadows there but do they do they stick him with uh do they put them with estrella down there like and there was a problem with that no um i they were on a show together i think recently right but yeah. not not together together yeah the, yeah the, i i would say the impression i got about like when est is with it is like they're aware and it's like okay, that's happening, but it's just like oh, just kind of like an inconvenience. It seems like that he teams with them They're sometimes, a, but well, they were complaining again. They were complaining again. This is Kento complaining. I feel like he complains a lot, and that uh, he was being forced to team. Like he didn't name names, but it was pretty clear what he was talking about. That why do I have to team with this guy? And if he doesn't agree to the terms and teaming with this guy, you know it has an effect on you know him getting a visa and all these other things because if you know if he produces a team with him he doesn't he's not working and if he's not working it's and you know the domino effect that goes from there so I, you know whatever it looks like they wrestled against one another in a tag match in december on a triple a house show but that's the only time cage match is showing them even linked with one another since since the split yeah, and that was around. Yeah, that was around the time. I mean, like I said before, I don't know if Australia wants to come back here anyway. So I, I I talked to somebody in Texas who is around Australia, and all I heard was that he seems to really enjoy he the yeah. the Mexico Texas Florida loop that he does. Yeah, he's really he's really happy. He's really happy overseas, and I think that you know, like I said, like times on the show so far you know whatever makes you happy so, for sure you know you know keep the affiliation and you know become reliable and you know become the point man in the u.s i mean there's worse things that you get I mean, shit. yen is 100 is 158 to a do- to a dollar now i'm like if i'm getting paid if i was getting paid in dollars i would not want to come back and get paid in yen i mean i would be looking for ways to get paid and i'm i'm i am looking for ways to get paid in dollars right now so 
don't be surprised when more more people go to get paid in dollars is what i'm saying yeah and it 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 does feel like something that like now it's it it's just now gotten like one it, it hovered around 150 then it was like 154 and it feels like now like the past 3 days it's just gotten more um, and more yeah yeah i'm starting to see 180 thrown around um you know i like i can tell you you know like i came back from like i hadn't been to the us i mean this is the first time i've been back to the us since i moved here in 2015 and you know i got on the plane coming back being pretty content in the idea that i'll probably never go back to the us you know permanently but now I'm here, and now the yen is 150 cent, 157 to a dollar. And you know, I'm, you know, I work in a major, major Jap publicly traded Japanese company with a lot of incredibly talented foreigners, you know, expats that have been here forever. They've got families. Even you know, even the ones that are lifers are starting to, you know, starting to talk about this isn't sustainable. So. Do you feel like quality of life, like in terms of crime, has that changed at all, or is it just the economy is just so far down? Um, cost of living and everything. I mean, like, there's no, there's no crime here. Yeah, I mean, that must be nice. Nothing. Um, but I mean, like, I'm shit, man. Um, well, I just say this, you know, I had to, I had to like open a new credit card, with, like a credit card that was like, uh, you know, spend spend X amount of dollars, you get this many points, you know, to do all my travel arrangements because I wanted to heavily leverage the points for the travel. And it was it was a, a US credit card, it was a Chase card. And uh you know, I mapped out my finances for the trip in February when it got finalized. And I was like, okay, well my bonus is gone, you know, because my bonus was coming in at the end of March. I knew the bonus would come in and that would go immediately to the card and that would do a pretty good amount of paying things off but uh while i was over there they that was when like the 152 153 started happening and I'm, fuck i got all you know like i'm going and doing all of this like i went to the supermarket and out of you know out of all the stuff in the u.s you know i could leave most of it at this point but american supermarkets are still pretty fucking great and so I went to the supermarket and i spent you know 50 dollars us and i paid with my japanese debit card and then i got i went and checked how much it cost it was like fucking eight thousand yen oh my god so like let's wait wait for it to come back down to 150 149 but i ended up panicking and you know paying off it was eight thousand dollars even on this credit card and it cost me however many it was like one point one point four million yen i think to pay it off and like I'm glad I did it because it would be 1.5 today. So, but I've noticed like I'm looking for an apartment, and I was looking for an apartment during the exact same time last year, and I regret I regret where I moved now. Like I hate I hate where I live. Uh, I want to move like as soon as the one year is up on my lease, like I want to move. But I'm looking and like the exact same apartment that I looked at last year during the time that I was that I ended up deciding on this apartment. It's like 19 like the rent has gone up like 19 percent or something absurd like that and that's that's across the board on rent on rent in every every neighborhood in tokyo and i'm also finding like i went to the supermarket today and like i didn't even buy anything today i bought like strawberries a quarter of a quarter of a watermelon and like like sponges for the sink and it was a thousand yen it was over it was over twenty dollars like what the fuck like everything is just so expensive and it's fine because I mean, now that the credit card's paid off, I don't have like anything in dollars that I need. To, I have like my who, like my U.S. Hulu, which is you know nine dollars, nine ninety nine. But even that, that's almost it's going to be two thousand yen soon. Like that's double, double. And like I spend, I spend a lot of money on Bandcamp, and like much less the dollar, or, like the yen to the euro and the British pound, it's even worse. So like my hundred dollar Bandcamp Fridays have turned into fucking 20,000 yen Bandcamp Fridays, which is more than I should be spending on such a hobby these days. So it, it's not sustainable. Like it, it, so um, I don't know. I need to find a side hustle like that pays me in dollars just, just so I have something. 
somewhere. Well, I feel the same way, and I live in America, so you're you're not alone. I also need a side hustle that that pays in dollars so that I can yeah. live easier. You're, you're still in the music industry, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm in I'm in the radio industry. Yeah. In the okay, so what's I mean, what's the? Let me ask you. I mean, this is we're kind of veering way off topic here, but what is the feeling on the ground about musicians and the visa, the visa fees going up? For the B one visas, like the processing fee is like going to be sixteen hundred dollars. It's like sixteen hundred dollars now, and like I was reading something about how that is going to have a major impact on you know small and medium sized touring. You know, like artists from outside the U S. that want to come and tour the U S. Like if you're not coming and doing a festival or coming or doing like you know a stadium tour, that it's become prohibitively expensive to to get a visa have you been, yeah I, well you i mean that's you know, that's, that? that's the touring industry at large right now is you have your your massive you know th there's an economy there for your massive stadium shows but any other form of of currency that you would hope to pick up from that industry you know it's it's a disaster you know just touring as a whole is in a very fragile state right now. And that's not to mention, you know, the lack of streaming royalties or anything like that. It's. I, and, I, and then also festivals completely changing now with the non-compete ruling that came down in, in that, that economy itself, the festival economy is in real danger, you know, because there's just, there's too many of them. And I, you know, I say this obviously with some bias, but when the, when the radio or I'm sorry, when the, when the music industry summer festival lineup was curated by radio stations, it seemed a lot healthier and the lineup seemed a lot more diverse. But now, you know, if you're, you know, even a mid-level artist, you decide at the start of the year, am I going to play the festivals this year or am I going to tour on my own this year? And so, you know, festival lineups are really stagnant because like, I think Austin city limits is normally the first one that announces and everybody can kind of go, okay, well, let me look at Austin city limits this band, this band, and this band, well, they'll do Lala, they'll do Coachella, they'll do Governor's Ball, and there's there's nothing there. So, you know, internationally, especially for smaller bands, it's a nightmare to begin with, but now it's getting worse due to what Jay was talking about. But, you know, domestically, it's not like there's a, a safe haven anywhere. It's still really rough. Yeah, and just to bring it back around, to extrapolate on that, is that pro wrestling is, I think, experienced something very similar to that, where you know, the, it's the medium-sized touring that is really affected, that was really destroyed during the pandemic. You know, like, the big events, like, you know, people like Taylor was in the Tokyo Dome and she sold it out, like, five, five straight days or whatever it was. But nobody else, like, the mid, like, the, like you know, the in, industrial and goth acts that I follow, like, I don't, everybody, you know, they're announcing, they're announcing tours everywhere but the U.S. and Japan. <laughs> They can't yeah. get into the U.S. because the visa, the visa processing is super expensive, and they can't get in, and it's not worth it to come to Japan. And the visa, the B visa for the musicians, is the same as pro wrestler visas. So, you know, I think I think that's for new visas. That sixteen hundred dollar processing. So, like, if you're renewing a visa, it's cheap. But if you're getting a new visa, that's when that cost comes in. So, like, you don't have a visa already, and you're coming from if you're coming from Dragon Gate, if you're someone on the like, if you're someone like Rioya who didn't, you know, the last round of visas was done before his debut. You know, are they going to spend? You know, is it worth it to spend sixteen hundred fifty dollars U.S., which is, you know, could be possibly twice that in yen by the time it comes around? And you know, that's a pretty, pretty big hit to you yeah. know any potential for a Japanese company to go to go overseas. So, well, let me let me let me put it to you this way because I think it'll make sense if I relate the Chicago music industry to Dragon Gate. So, for decades and decades and decades in Chicago, the venue you would play before you played an arena was the Aragon Ballroom, which is about a forty five hundred cap. And the Aragon is a Live Nation venue, and it does well, and they still draw you know a ton of big artists there, and it's a big deal when people play there. But two years ago, a venue opened here called the Salt Shed, which is a thirty five hundred cap. And the amount of shows they get from artists that are so much happier to play a 3,500 cap than a 4,500 cap, just because of where touring is at and because of where the economy is at here, they've become the top dog 
in the live music industry here. Like it's that venue has become a huge deal because every show's selling out. So it's good PR, but it's really, yeah. it's just because they have to draw a thousand less people than they would, you know, down the street at the Aragon, you know, for, and right. you know, Dragon Gate's the same way. I'm sure they would love to have, you know, they'd love to sell as many tickets as possible, but they would also love to have the pressure of selling a thousand less tickets for a sellout. Yeah, yeah, and that and that that's across the board. I mean, that's I think everybody is kind of picking up on that. I mean, even you know, the other companies that were doing empty big arena shows last year have scaled back this year and aren't doing that. As yeah, much. no, luckily that trend has stopped. I think also and, the rent fees going back to normal probably changed that too, didn't it? Change back? Um, I mean, it depends on the venue. I mean, some places didn't really discount that much. You know, for some places, it was mostly just the idea of, well, the cap is 50% of the attendance anyway. So, you know, we don't... You can't we can, really we don't charge have full. To, yeah, you know, we don't... It doesn't matter if we only do a half full house because that's the most we can do anyway. And then you have pandemic excuses and everything beyond. And not, not excuses, all, you know, that valid pandemic reasoning for those, for those sorts of things. and. You know, like I saw something in sumo. There's like a controversy in sumo because, um, you know, like the pro wrestling terms, like you know, the vac- you know, super no vacancy, you know, super no vacancy, full house, you know, like the money and so money, you know, those those all came from sumo. And like the the real Goku shows, they've been doing you know, Cholmani for six thousand people when it used to be eight thousand people or whatever it was, and they're kind of wondering, you know, well, why is it, you know what's the logic behind this and it's just the reality you know it's just what it is now you know like who wants to go and sit four people to a box when you could sit at home and you know watch it on tv not miss too much of the experience like if it, if i had to choose between sitting and watching on a streaming service or sitting next sitting in a you know sitting cross-legged in a sumo box with some person i don't know stay in home stay in home well, that's sort of been the, um, the the gift and the curse of Wrestle Universe, right? Is that service is almost so nice that why would you well, leave your home when you can just watch it there? Well, you know, for those companies, it's not Wrestle Universe; it's Abema, um, because Abema does all the free streams and pricing everything at free has put the value of watching your product at free. You know, so that yeah. I, it's Abema that's done way more damage. To, you know, the, the thing about it, the thing about the streaming sites in Japan is that, you know, you have to have the streaming service, but at the same time, you don't want the streaming service to be too good. You know what I mean? Because you don't want people like the local, like the streaming service has to be there for the people who can't make it to the venue, but you don't want the streaming service to be so convenient that the people who can come to the venue choose to stay home. I, I'm almost convinced now that the remodel of New Japan World was an inside job that made that service so much worse that now people have to buy tickets to New Japan shows. Is it bad? I uh, maybe I'm on an island. I hate the new New Japan World. I think you, everything you is aren't so the only good. one. Okay, good. I think everything is so much harder to find when they when they migrated sites. They gutted the archives, and I, I it's not like I was using really? the archives a ton, but. It was nice to know that that stuff was there if I needed it. I everybody used to complain on the English side of things about the the lower video quality on the original world site that it was like 720p compared to what Wrestle Universe was operating at. That case, yeah. it wasn't even 720p. Was it, was, it not? It it, it, it wasn't even HD. It was 540. But that did not bother me because I liked the side that I could find everything, and I can't find shit on the new New Japan World. Yeah, well, I mean. You know, Wrestle Universe is run by, a, you know, a proper media media company that has that has engineers that do this. Like, there's a lot of talented engineers at at Cyber Agent, and whereas you know, Bushi Road is a live event group that has to has to make you know, like they're still making you know, like their gotcha games and like all their mobile games are still stuck in you know, 2000, you know, 2015, 2000. 16 type era so like and i can't really talk because we've got people who you know people who built our site look like they haven't learned anything since 
you know, 2002 in terms of their coding, but, you know, like that, you know, Wrestle Universe has a, is owned by a company that has a lot of really talented engineers that could actually make a proper, a proper media app. So, you know, good for them. No, I, I can tell. And they've added Osaka Pro, which means they're going to get me to resubscribe. It, it's something where I kind of look at Abema and Cyber Agent, where I, it, it, it it's like the one place that there actually is like a, a not not like a one to one peg, but like I look at that service very much like a, I you probably haven't heard of Pluto or Tubi, Jay, but they are yeah, the, I don't know what you mean. yeah yeah the the, the uh, free ad supported television, and it seems like everything is going to go towards that. Like eventually, when at least in the states, when everything just turns into uh, subscription model streaming and everyone dropping the cable except for sports, it's just going to be this fast service. And it just, in a way, it feels like that Abema and by proxy uh, Wrestle Universe, by the fact that it's like all geared towards that and is already working towards like what that eventuality end of television is going to be. Just seems like that they just have like the gigant, the ginormous leg up on everyone else. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I mean, Abema has never been profitable. It looks like it's going to be profitable this year, which would be a big step. Um, but you know, Japan doesn't. It's still you know, Japan's old, and old people don't keep up with this sort of thing. Um. Like I just when I was in the U.S., I got my mom off of Directv. Finally, like my mom, my mom's had a smart TV for almost a decade now, and it's never been hooked up to Wi-Fi. I went and like I plugged plugged in the LAN cable. Like, okay, I know I'm going to need to update this. The TV has not been updated. It's it's still on like version one point whatever, and like the actual updated firmware is like four point something. Like the firmware is so old that it can't receive automatic firmware updates. <laughs> and like so i finally got her off direct tv i got went we went and we got her a roku box and like i set her up on streaming services but like he had to write everything down on paper like okay this is how i search for things this is where i go you know she's like well how do i watch ion i'm just like, <laughs> you know, trying to trying to you know explain to her the mindset okay you're not locked in to what's on at eight o'clock anymore if you want to watch, you know, NCIS or, you know, whatever, you can go and you could watch every episode, whichever, 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 whichever episode you want up to the most recent one. So please, you know, try to understand, and like she's writing it down on paper and everything. And most of Japan is the same age as my mom. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll see on that, you know, getting, you know, getting Abema profitable is going to be a first step and if they can, if they can get it this year then it'll be a big leg up but you also have to consider that Abema is uh you know Fujita the the cyber agent founder and the president he's stepping down in 2026 I think 2025 2026 he's he's retiring and you know when the founder steps down you know that's you know the pet projects tend to get a little more scrutiny with it. You know, Ted Turner and WCW, right? From a pro wrestling perspective. Oh, that's absolutely. An, you know, yeah. Easy, that's an easy, easy example. And like, and, um, you know, the stock price, you know, they're a publicly traded company. And, you know, I also work for a publicly traded company that the stock isn't doing too well. So, cost, you know, there's cost cutting, you know, and that's, you know, that's standard across any industry. So, you know, if their stock price isn't doing well and, there's nobody there to protect anymore. Suddenly, you know, the money losing wrestle, wrestling company, you know, that is also something to watch out for. But what do you guys, what do you guys think about Stardom going under the New Japan banner? I think it's purely like it, they needed to be this like years ago, essentially, because like Bushi Fight hasn't like put on like a kickboxing show in four years, right? Like it's a dead, it was a dead and department. All, the, the gyms were losing money and the protein business it was a disaster. Yeah. So has, has there been any speculation about the idea of that they're just putting everything in a nice package so when it's time to sell, they can sell both together? I mean, that's definitely like the, the the line of thinking. Like, if you have this all together, you have one person now overlooking all of it, and it's very easy yeah. to 
either spin off or divest of it yeah it, it, yeah so it's like if new japan's gonna run like osaka joe hall on saturday you could have stardom in whatever venue on sunday and not have to have a separate set of staff yeah I mean, and that that, that was their the public stuff. statement which I, I i was not very skeptical of i tend to believe that it was actually necessary consolidation if they want to run both more efficiently yeah yeah it, yeah there's a lot going on you think, you think, you think tony Khan's just gonna come and buy them both i mean he would have to want to be in japan right like that's always the thing would about he, tony would he would he i i, I mean, I mean it, it, unless he's going to send Mookie Ghana over there to do more transactions like he did last time. But but TK, historically, if he if he's a part of something, he is super, super hands on. I mean, that's sort of the problem with Ring of Honor is he bought Ring of Honor. And Mike, unless you know differently, unless something's changed, he's insisting on still. Yep. He still the wants po- to bundle it. Yeah. Yeah. He's well, he, he's insisting on still being the point person for ROH. And it's like, well, you have. You have other things you need to worry about, so then that whole promotion just kind of falls by the wayside. And I can't oh, imagine him with his injury. <laughs> with his neck injury. <laughs> well, his neck injury. He said the man should be recuperating. I well, look, it was uh, you know o- Okada and you know Jay. You were the first person I talked to when I heard the Okada news, but I mean, I knew he would be good. I was not expecting him to be a seamless, seamlessly transition into a brilliant American TV wrestler as soon as he did. That was a. Uh, what's the what's the temperature take on that on that move? I think when we talked about it, it was before we knew where he was going. Yeah, uh, ev- everybody. I mean, like, I did not talk to a single Japanese person, inside wrestling or outside of wrestling, that, that even considered AEW because it was for him specifically. This is not you know this this logic would not. Apply necessarily apply to anybody but him specifically but for him specifically AEW was not a step up so what i mean from the the ravenous new japan fans i mean what's the what's been the take on this i mean are people mad that he went to AEW, or are like people happy that he's there because now they can just drop new japan entirely and they've got you know the smash brothers roster is one one step closer to being completed or what so like I th- I think it's like different camps. Like there's definitely the joke I use is not the Smash Brothers. It's Tony Khan has now completed his all in 2018 playset, and now he's moving on to the PWG 2018 playset. But it's yeah. it, it it's something where like I feel like that there are certain camps about uh, Okada and about New Japan. There were the ones that were like, well. Price. He essentially, by just being paid in dollars, he's going to get a fifty percent raise if he's just paid exactly the same rate as he did in New Japan. So, like, yeah, no, right. like monetarily, like that just makes total sense. And then there are there was I, I I think without sounding like I'm trying to be uh, like pointing folks out, there was a significant camp of people that kind of in a way were just so over Akata and the way that he departed new japan that they just in a way where it's like okay just go to aew and leave me with uh, uh low singer Renobles, you know so I, there it, was a lot of frustration that he didn't do it really the right anoint way. anybody or make anybody on his way out but i also i'm of the belief that once that story became public you can't just have yoda suji beat him and be like see guys we we okada put somebody over like at that point the cat was out of the bag mm. <sighs> I don't know. Is there anybody over? Is there any of those guys o- over there that like would losing to Okada actually do anything for any of those guys? I mean, well, I, I Suji's over, but I th- he to me is the only young guy that's really making a difference there. He didn't need Okada one way or the other, but like an Umino or a Narita, I think the thought is like, hey, why didn't Okada help them out? Yep. But I, you know, on a, on a personal level, I'm I like that he left just because it's interesting, and I think he's been so good in AEW that I'm I'm very into it. And hey, we had Pack versus Okada. Exactly. That, that's like one half of the Dragon System getting to finally see the other half of the Dragon System for like all for like the first time. So at least for me, it happened at like what nine nine forty five p.m. in the middle of a dynamite before 
some crazy before some wacky promo and no no this was this was on the pay-per-view that yeah, this opened the oh, pay-per-view no, on pay-per-view. sunday yeah, yeah. it's it it really good it got 20 minutes it was, it was like the second longest thing on the card other than i think the uh bucks match oh and no maybe, no, no. maybe danielson osprey danielson osprey was longer but like it got a lot it, of time and pack i mean it's not i don't around. think like, I he don't came back name, like, he just came anymore. back this was his yeah. comeback okay yeah he had a real real bad injury like yeah. to the extent that people who uh hear from him were were pretty much thinking like that that there was an opportunity that this would have been it for him so he's been back pretty yeah. much since uh okada came over and yeah it, it, it's something where each time i see pack i'm just like oh we did not realize in the moment how good he was even back in like 2012 yeah he's super good he was yeah back with special i mean all, all all the foreigners they had at that time were special yeah, but Pac stuff ages really well. You just, you know, you turn on like a random World One era Pac match, and you're just like, oh my god! Like, I know everybody liked him, but how were we not just all collectively losing our minds at just the basic things he could do better than everybody else? And so, yeah, I mean, look, when he's healthy, he's he's incredible. Still, he's as good as ever. Yeah, you know, it's like he was he was he kind of bridged the gap between guys like Amazing Red or Sugi, who were spectacular high flyers, but there was, or, or and Evan, Evan too, obviously is the other one that would fall into that category where they were really spectacular, but there was also kind of that un, kind of scary element to it where you weren't really sure where they where they were going to land. You know what I mean? Like, oh, oh, I mean Jack all the time. I mean the the infamous uh, cage of death bump. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of liken it to like, just to throw my hobbies together here, but like skateboarding, how it was like, there were people that were in the early 90s or in the heading into the mid 90s, everything was like, there were people that were doing super technical, super spe- kind of spectacular stuff, but it was like really sketchy, really low to the ground. And it wasn't until, you know, guys like Penny came over and they started doing all the technical stuff but big with precision, with speed, with force, that it really it elevated and pushed the sport forward. And like, yeah, like the the, the, the PJ Lad video. Yeah, you know, skateboarding, pro wrestling, and basketball, NBA basketball are like the three the three sports that are completely unrecognizable to me from like the mid like the mid nineties, like. The like and the I I was in a barber shop and they had an NBA game on and they just you know chucking half court threes and all that like the game is completely unrecognizable from what it was you know ten years before twenty years before and um and whether that be because of LeBron or because of Steph Curry or you know whatever there's always like you know that one generational talent that bridges that takes that kind of rough edge potential and is like the catalyst that moves it, takes it to the next level and forces people to step their game up. And I think that impact is that was that for the high flying aspect of pro wrestling and that he was the first one that was doing six thirties, the three sixty shooting star press, the high angle shooting star presses where it wasn't like the guy was doing the shooting star press, but doing it like Billy Kidman where, you know, you didn't know where he was going to land. You know, I, I, you know, Seidel obviously also had the great shooting star press, but, you know, Pac needs to get more respect for being like that fucking guy, the guy that pushed high flying out of being like the out of control, filling off the cage, landing on your head, high flying to, you know, what we have now with guys like Ricochet Osprey and all those other guys that are doing like, you know, that do the, the spectacular high flying with, absolute precision speed and force so i'm you know it sucks that he's not here but i'm glad he's over there getting paid and gets to be on you know and get those types of opportunities For yeah sure. it, it, it's worth going out of your way to check out the okada match they worked that one really kind of smartly especially considering how pack conducts himself more as a tweener in the states now and it it, it, it was a really kind of nice moment to see you know someone from udo6 
finally face a former Dreamgate champion. So I, I, yeah. I was a big fan of that. Well, well, Jay, it's we've gone on uh, super long. Uh, I know it's uh, getting close to midnight over there in Tokyo. Thank you again. Yeah, sorry, so for the, much. sorry for the tangent. Oh, no, no, I no, enjoyed I, it. We, we love the tangents yeah. and uh, we greatly yeah. appreciate it. And the listeners too, like knowing these little like kind of facets of other parts of kind of Japan and wrestling industry that people don't necessarily talk about that yeah, often. It sucks over here. Nah, not you know stay home get paid in dollars is my advice right now <laughs> <laughs> well uh, uh well dead or alive is coming up on the fifth it's the dragon gates golden week spectacular the last show in aichi prefectorial gym more likely for dragon gate uh it's a 3 p.m local time start that's 1 a.m on the east coast 10 a.m on the west jay you ha- the, the the network has a real busy start of may coming up it seems like all the tv loop yeah. spots are getting taken care of one after another yeah so we've got there's two shows in kyoto the third and the fourth and you know the the kyoto shows are the are where natural vibes formed you know in 2018 so this is you know we're coming up on the six year anniversary of natural vibes is this weekend chapter three of natural vibes started at dead or alive two years ago so this is you know, so we've got those two shows, and we've got Dead or Alive, and then we'll be, we'll be back in Tokyo on the 9th. And then Kansai, Osaka, and Kobe on the 11th and 12th. Um, the Hong Kong shows were supposed to be live, but they are now not going to be live because it, they're not confident that they could do it reliably. But they'll be on the network at a later time. And then Triple Shot in Hokkaido, the 24th, 25th, 26th, three days. And then in but then in June there's a whole bunch of stuff as we head into as we head into world. So as always, May first is typically the best time to oh, real quick. Um the network has, for credit people who pay with a credit card, um they used to charge the following month. So if you subscribed in April, you would get billed in May. And it's now changed to current month billing. So if you look on your if you look on your credit card statement in April and you see two charges from the network, it's not a mistake. It's just that you were charged for March and April at the same time. This is just for credit just for credit card people. So just keep that in mind. Um, but anyway, March first is a good time to sign up. There's what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine nine live shows plus the Hong Kong shows. Um, and then in June there's gonna be one, two, three, four, five. Five, maybe seven live shows, and then in July we've got we've got World. So there's plenty of stuff coming. So now is it, I don't know if there's anybody that's actually listening to this that isn't signed up for the network. But if not, please sign up. Give give us your dollars, please. It's a, the cheapest time possible. It's probably like eight dollars US to sign up right now. So um, have at it, please. Absolutely, and Jay, we'll have to have you back before Kobe World. It's it's it feels like a, not to go on an, another thing like coming up on like the the uh, it's not the twenty fifth Kobe show at Kobe World Memorial Hall, but it does really feel like that. I'm hoping at least that uh, Kobe World ends up being a big one. This might be the last one too, because there is a and but but on a happier note, because there is a new venue, a new large venue opening in Kobe. With a similar capacity, but better, better accessibility, and it's oh, brand nice. new, state of the art. It's a smart arena, and it seems like it would be a no-brainer because it would be it wouldn't be a huge step up in capacity, but it from a production point of view, um, you know, it would make all it make all the sense in the world. I don't don't know if it makes sense to them, but in my head, it makes all the sense in the world. Oh, so. Well, neat. We'll have to talk about that in July when we have you on to talk about Kobe World coming sure. up. Sure. No problem. Well, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Jay. You could follow Jay on Twitter at DG underscore Jay. We are at Open Voice Gate. Case personally is that underscore in your case. I'm at Fuji Heya. Thanks for listening to Open Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next time. Take care, everyone. 
Hola, hola, my name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí.